Dejuan, thank you for your help. We appreciate it. Hello, 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 hello. The other two mics had been off. <laughs> One more check so we can get started. We will not. Hi, Miss Hansberry.
to go get these other two guys. Of what they're doing. That makes me so that's why I know it's funny. Although never a clothing related one. <laughs> Ms. Johnston, you ready? You have the equipment you need? Yes, sir. All right, let's go back on the record in the matter concerning Judge Coomer. Uh, the break was a little longer than usual. Don't get used to that, but we were very, very successful with uh, technology. And there is now a live feed of the proceedings through my YouTube channel on the Fulton County Superior Court website. Each judge has a feed, and if you go to that website and click on McBurney, um, you'll see what you see on the screen right now, the four cameras. I'll take that off our screens in a minute, and it will revert back to the displays that either side puts up. But uh, um, you're live now, so just keep that in mind. As, uh, you're conducting yourself, um, but we will keep the breaks a little bit shorter next time. Um, thank you again to Cobb County's IT and there was one question, we didn't introduce ourselves, the panelists. I'm Robert McBurney. I'm a judge from Superior Court in Fulton County. Dax Lopez, I'm a partner at Del Campo, Grayson and Lopez. Jack Winter, and I'm a retired businessman. Thank you both. Mr. Boring, the job is yours now. Thank you, Your Honor. The director would call Judge Christian Kimmer. Judge Coomer, you're going to be our first, so we'll see how it works with the witness stand and everything. Let us know if the equipment is in the right place for you. So I'll swear him in, Judge. Uh, sure, why don't you? I swear from the testimony you'll give this hearing panel on the matter before them will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. I do. Okay, you can lower your hand. Uh, sir, would you please introduce yourself to the hearing panel by telling them your name and spelling it so the court reporter gets it correct. Give me one second, please. Fix this chair so it doesn't rock away with me. My name is Christian Coomer. And what else would you like me to tell? Uh, spell it so the court reporter gets it correct. C-O-O-M-E-R. And Christian, normal spelling. Yes. All right. Judge Coomer, um, you would agree that you have a, a a special duty to clients as an attorney when you're representing them, right? Yes. And when you do that, you have to comply with the code, the Georgia Rules of Professional Conduct, correct? Yes. Um, and as a judge, you're held to even higher ethical standards. Would you agree with that? Yes, a complete, a uh, different set of standards, yes. And as a judge, you have a duty um, to observe standards of conduct so that the independence and the integrity of the judiciary uh, can be preserved, correct? Yes. And one of your jobs is to promote the public confidence uh, in the integrity and impartiality of the court. You would agree with that? Yes. Now, as your attorney said in opening, just to get it out, um, you admit that you violated rule 1.8C of the Georgia Rules of Professional Conduct, correct? Can, I, I, if you could show me the rule, that would help me. There are a lot of rules we're gonna talk about, I understand. 1.8C being the rule that you are not allowed to draft a will where you are the beneficiary of that instrument. That's correct. Okay. So you would agree you violated that rule by drafting the wills for Mr. Philhart as you did in May of 2018 and September of 2018. 
Yes, I violated the rules by drafting a, a will that gave me a testamentary gift is what I understand, yes. Right, yes, and that, that rule's so clear, that's not even a waivable conflict. You can't waive that rule, correct? I don't know the answer to that. Okay, um, so you, you did that once in May of 2018 uh, in that will where you made yourself not only the beneficiary, but you were also the executor and trustee of that will, correct? In the May 2018 will, I was, yes, I was the executor and trustee as well as a beneficiary. And I, I think before you've agreed, and you would agree today that you did not discuss the possible conflicts of that type of representation with Mr. Philhart and get a written confirmation of having had that discussion. I don't remember what, I don't remember testifying about that before, but I, we did not have a written conflict statement uh, with regard to the wills. I, I thought we had a statement that was satisfactory, but it turns out, I think, in review, and, and it's not. So you didn't do the required written confirmation that you had discussed those types of conflicts, correct? That's right. All right, and at the time you drafted that will, Mr. Philhart was 76 years old, correct? I think that's right. right okay. And also, again, um, in the summer of 2018, you violated Rule 1.8C by drafting that irrevocable living trust with yourself as a beneficiary as well, correct? Uh, I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, I haven't looked at that particular issue. I, I, I thought we were talking about the will. The trust was never funded, so I, I didn't pay a lot of attention to that. You've issue. read the amended formal charges, correct? Yes, yes, of course. Okay, and you've seen that that's a charge that you created that irrevocable living trust and made yourself a beneficiary, correct? Yes. Okay. So you did create your, that trust as a beneficiary and you drafted that instrument, correct? Yes, I did. Okay. And then again, in September, on September 19th, 2018, you drafted, uh, I guess, the final will that you drafted for Mr. Uh, Phil Hart, correct? September 2018, is that what you said? September 19th, 2018. Yes. And that was five days after it had been announced that you were going to be appointed to the judgeship that you currently uh, sit on, right? Correct. And again, you admit on that day, as a judicial candidate waiting to be sworn in, you violated Rule 1.8C again by drafting a will that made you a beneficiary of the will that you drafted. Yes. And then you remained, after you got sworn in as a judge by the governor and you <coughs> took your seat on the bench, you remained a beneficiary on that draft, correct? Yes, until I think April of 2019. But in this one, you actually, you changed the executor and trustee to your wife, Heidi, correct? Well, I drafted the will the way Jim Philhart wanted it drafted, and that was to change the, that term to have Heidi as the executor. And you suggested Heidi as the person to be the executor and trustee, correct? No. Okay. Who suggested that? Jim. So that was Jim's idea. It was Jim's idea. You, you were present for your wife's deposition, correct? Yes. You're aware she had no idea what an executor or trustee even did when she was named that, correct? No. No, it's not correct, or no, she didn't know what those roles would be? I don't remember what she testified to. I believe she did know what those roles were. Okay. At the time, she was named executor and trustee of Mr. Phil Hart's will, you believe she, your wife, understood what those roles entailed? I think she had a, a, a layman's understanding of that. I mean, she'd, she'd been my executor on my will for many years, and we'd talked about that. So I, I don't know. I don't know if she could give a lawyer's definition, but I think she understood generally. How about power of attorney? Did she know what that was yes, at the sir. time? And did you just, was she going to rely on you to explain what those things meant and what she needed to do if, God forbid you actually had to effectuate the will? Well, I think she would have sought legal advice for that and not from me, but from others. Okay. Who would she have gone to? Well, I, she referenced having, uh, I, well, I don't know if she referenced it or not in the deposition. I know she, we have neighbors who she could have talked to. She, we have friends who she could have talked to. 
She also, you remember her testifying that she could rely on you as her husband because she trusted you? I think she did say that, yes. And during this time, after you've taken the bench as a judge, you would agree that you didn't attempt to change the will, you didn't withdraw yourself as the beneficiary, you didn't do anything to change that will or ask Mr. Philhart to change that will, correct? After September 18th or 19th, 2018. That's correct. No, let me, can you ask me that question again? I'm not sure I understood what you're asking. Okay. Did you ever do anything to change the will after September 19th, 2018, where you were a beneficiary on the will that you had drafted? No, other than suggesting to Jim that if he wanted to make other changes to the will, he would need to ask another attorney to do that. All right. So you'd agree that during this time that you were um, involved with Mr. Phil Hart, both as an attorney and then, as you've said, a friend, um, that you took out loans. The combined total of these three loans were over $300,000, right? I don't uh, think, I thought it was two hundred. dollars Okay. You took out one loan for $159,000, correct? Yes. Okay. You took out another loan for $130,000, correct? Yes. And then you took out another loan for $80,000, correct? Oh, yes. Yes. The total of those, yes, would have been over $300,000. And during the time that you were actually sitting as a court of appeals judge, you still had $280,000 in outstanding loans due to Mr. Philhart at some point, correct? Yes. And you kept, you kept up payments on those loans until um, you actually were sued by Mr. Phil Hart and then settled it by paying them off, correct? That's incorrect. You I didn't kept, make payments? I, I did make the payments. You asked me two questions. Okay. So the answer to the first question is yes, I kept up the payments. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you, you did that until you actually paid off the loans and you settled the lawsuit, correct? I did that until I paid off the loans, which was not part of settling the lawsuit. Okay. It was after the lawsuit had been filed, correct? Yes. And your attorneys talked to Wright Gammon about having that done, correct? Yes. Well, they talked to him about settling the case. That's, that's right. All right. And you agree that, for instance, the March loan. I guess if I can just be clear, the, the payment of the, the, the payoff of the loans was not part of the settlement. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. But I mean, you wouldn't have paid it off like that if they hadn't sued you, correct? No, that's not correct. Okay, you would have just paid it off anyway without ever having been asked by Mr. Phil Hart and then sued by him? I would have paid them off as they were, as the terms of the law. Okay, that's what I mean. Okay, you would not have paid them off in 2020, but for the lawsuit. I, I paid them off after the lawsuit. Yes, that's right. Just so we're clear, paying off in my mind, is not making the periodic payments, but paying the remaining principal, uh, which Correct. happened in 2020. As I'm understanding your answer now, I would not have done that but for the lawsuit. You would have continued to pay on a regular basis had there been no lawsuit. But because of the lawsuit, whether it's part of the settlement or not, um, you elected to pay off those loans in full. Yes. And just on that note, while we're on it, um, the, the March 2018 loan, the $159,000, you would have kept paying on that until it was paid off over its terms, correct? Yes, and I want to be clear about one other thing. There, you had mentioned over $300,000 in loans. There was a, an initial loan of $80,000, and that one was paid off before the second loan was taken. Right, and we're going to get into the details of that, absolutely, yes. Right. Um, I didn't want Judge McMurray to have the wrong impression about how I had paid off those loans. Okay, well, I, I think I've covered it in opening pretty clearly, but we'll get to it in detail. You'll have your chance. Um, and speaking of that $159,000 loan, if you're going to pay it every month until it came due, you admit that that loan was not due until 30 years from the date that you entered that promissory note, correct? That's right. And Mr. Phil Hart would have been well over 100 years old, correct? Yes. All right. And you're aware that the Average life expectancy for a male in the United States now is 76 years old. I, I don't know that to be the case. I don't, I, I wouldn't argue it. You would say, you would agree objectively. That sounds kind of ridiculous having a loan with somebody that's going to come due when they're 106. No. You think that makes sense? Yes. You think that's fair? Yes. Okay. All right. And this loan was made to your LLC, correct? Yes. And it throughout the time of, the loans being made to Mr. Phil Hart until um, the lawsuit, you would agree that 
CAC LLC had very limited assets. I'm sorry, say that again. You would agree that from 2017, let's say that 2017 to 2019, CAC LLC had limited assets. Yes. Okay. Obviously not enough to cover the amount of loans that you had outstanding, correct? That's correct. And you would also agree there's no record of any of these loans that you took out from Mr. Philbard as far as being filed public, correct? I, I don't understand what you mean. Did you file anything, a security deed, anything of that nature uh, to reflect that this loan existed? No, we just had the writing between us. Okay. You had notaries on the will. You had witnesses on the will. Did you have a notary or a witness to the loan at all? I don't remember. I don't think so. In fact, you've testified before that nobody knew about these loans except you and Mr. Fullhart, maybe your wife, right? I don't remember testifying to that. Well, is it true? Are you, are you all the only ones who knew about it? As far as I knew, Jim knew about it. I knew about it. Whoever else he told, I, I didn't know. You didn't share it or anything with other people that you were taking out loans from a client, correct? I did not discuss with anybody else that I had borrowed money from Jim Philhart. Okay, and this, you'd agree, these loans had no security. That's correct. The one that you made and took in September of 2018 as a um, candidate for judicial office, you would agree that that one did not even pay interest to Mr. Philhart, correct? No, that's incorrect. Okay, what interest was, it? let me rephrase that. The interest that was due to Mr. Philhart, would that have been at the end of the balloon payment? Yes, it was a balloon note with one payment at the end of a period of eight years. Right, and that would have been in 2026? Yes. When Mr. Philhart was 84, 85 years old? Yes. So you didn't have to pay anything until it came due when he's 84, 85 years old, correct? That's correct. Okay. And you agree he had to um, liquidate some of his stocks in order to be able to make you that loan? Yes. And in doing that, he liquidated the stocks and then you received it and you put the money into your own investment account, correct? UBS. Yes, the, the money was paid into CAC Holdings and then I transferred it to a, a personal investment account. Okay. Within a couple of weeks. Sure. Uh, yes. I'm not sure exactly the time frame. Okay. Okay. You agreed that as part of the ethics commission uh, consent agreement, you paid $25,000 fine. Campaign finance commission. The ethics commission. Yes. The, yeah. Uh, can we agree to just call it the ethics commission for the uh, purposes of this hearing? So we don't have to go into that full name every time. Yeah, campaign Finance Commission is fine. With me. All right, Campaign Finance Commission. You paid a twenty-five thousand dollars fine, correct? Yes. And you? Well, you, no, I paid a twenty-five thousand dollars civil penalty. Civil penalty. And you agree that that's you understand that's the largest the judge has ever paid in the state of Georgia. I don't know. What's the difference in your mind between a civil penalty and a fine? Fine, in my mind, indicates some is is associated with a criminal action. All right. <clears throat> So you agree Mr. Philhart told you at some point in 2019 in February that he wanted his money back, right? In February two, I'm, I'm sorry. I was still thinking about Judge McBurney's question to me. Can you ask that again? In, in February of 2019, Jim Philhart emailed you and said he wanted his money back in some shape or form, correct? Yes. And wanted you off his wills. Correct. And your first response to him included uh, you reminding him that during your time as an attorney and friend that he had confided in you about mental difficulties. You'd agree with that? No, I, my first response was that I didn't have any objection to changing whatever he wanted to change. In the first email that you sent in response to his on February 22nd, you heard me read it in openings. Didn't you go into immediately in that first response talking about the mental difficulties he had had that he had shared with you over the time of you representing him? I don't remember the detail, the exact words in the email. You can read them or let me read it. That'd be fine. All right. I'm going to tender at this point. We've judged this for the record. We have stipulated to the authenticity of all of our exhibits. There may be objections to hearsay and that type of thing, depending, but I think most of these we're going to be agreeing on the admission of. So instead of saying, do you recognize it? How do you recognize it? I'm just going to tender it as an exhibit and see if we get an objection. Sure. Do you all have an exhibit list? 
We do. We didn't ask for one, but if you have one, that would be helpful. Maybe during the break, we could get an exhibit list. So we're able to keep track as well. We can do that, Judge. Great. Okay. So this is State, director's uh, Excuse me, Director's Exhibit 153. That's a really high number. It is. The, a lot of these numbers are actually um, joint exhibits from the uh, depositions. And so uh, this was toward the end. Okay. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Short well, before you put it up, so let's just work through the Sorry. admission. And this is one actually that's, um, I'm going to tender uh, exhibit 153. All right, any objection to the admission of Directors 153? Okay, it's admitted. And are, are we calling the exhibits that you and Ms. Cross are advancing directors exhibits, JQC? I just wanna use the right nomenclature. How did you use it in the deposition? I think we've just used them generally and generically as exhibits. And so, um, I, yeah, I think we're just common exhibits. So I think we're just gonna go through and not say director, uh, responded and we'll just have joint exhibits there. You know, it'll, the record will reflect who tendered it, but I think it, it's what we've discussed before is just keeping it generic. So if Mr. Lefko had wanted to tender the email we're talking about, you would have said exhibit 153 as well? Well, I actually have a compilation exhibit and you can start all the way down to 175. But, okay. Um, I know that exhibit exists and don't have any objection to it. Great. I just so when as the panel is referring to it, we're just going to call them exhibits now. Easier for us. We don't have to say respondent or Judge Kumer or whatnot. So exhibit 153 is in as tendered by the director. Just so there's no mistake, one through 159 were joint exhibits of the depositions, and not that or separate. It starts at 160. I'll start at 300. Okay. But again, it will just be an exhibit number. You're going to tender at some point exhibit 302. It's just exhibit 302. Okay, great. I've got state, or excuse me, habit. Um, exhibit 153. I'll, I'll put it up uh, on our uh, display. I don't know if that will. It's going to appear in a moment. Well, Once I've admitted documents, I'll try to leave them up on the, the panel. Okay, uh, Judge, looking at this email, this is. Uh, your response on February the 22nd, 2019 at 1.57 p.m. Let me scroll down so you can make sure you see that. Is that accurate, the date and time? Yes, February 22nd, 2019, 1.57 p.m. As I read in the opening statement, you um, had that first paragraph. You talked about uh, the issues and sorry he felt this way. What I'm getting at is the next paragraph in your first response to his February 22nd, 2019 email. Yes. Okay. Um, why don't you go ahead and read out loud what it was you responded to him uh, in that next paragraph? <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm worried you might, I'm worried about you because you've told me that you're losing your memory and think you might be struggling mentally. I've, been, I've seen you become emotionally upset without provocation and I've noticed you having sudden unexplained mood swings. You even said you don't want to live anymore. Let me keep going. Yes, please. I didn't tell you to sell your stocks and I don't know anything about that. I know you have developed a new close relationship to a man that Kay or I had never heard of in our years of knowing you. You told me that man said he wanted to manage your affairs for you. What is most troublesome to me is your comment that you can no longer call me, talk to me or visit with me. That doesn't sound like the Jim Philhart I've come to know over the years. I worry those words are someone else's desires and not your own. Two weeks ago today, you emailed me to tell me how much you enjoyed visiting and having dinner in my home with my family. This sudden and dramatic change is unsettling to me. All that is to say, I care about your welfare and I want, I want you to do what is best for you. We should resolve this matter, matter together as soon as we can to make that happen as easily as possible. That's as far as I can see. Okay. And I think that covers what I was getting at, that in that first response to his email to you wanting to sever ties, um, you brought up things that he'd shared with you as a client, as a friend over the years about his mental difficulties, correct? I was referring to conversations we'd had in the, in the, in the recent uh, weeks before this email as a friend. Mm -hmm. He told you that he didn't want to live anymore? Um, he had, I, I, obviously that's in the email. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so your response is to talk about his mental capacity. Though you're the first one who ever brought up his mental capacity, correct? No. Okay, according when did he bring my, it up? According to my email, he, he was telling me that he was struggling mentally. I mean, in the context of this controversy with Mr. Philhart, starting with this February 22nd, 2019 day, when everything went off the rails, the first person to talk about his mental deficiencies or the possibilities of it impacting him is you, correct? In this email? Yes. Uh, yes, in this email I addressed. Did he ever voice a concern similar to February 22nd, like he did in this email before then, about wanting you off of his wills and uh, blaming you for his taxes and all that type of stuff? Well, there was another email before this one in which he said something about his loans. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't remember all of the issues he addressed in there. I know he also talked about his heat pump in that mm -hmm. email. I don't remember right. all that was in there. But that was in no way the same thing as what happened on February 22nd, 2019. You would agree that this email is what started the dissolution of your relationship with Mr. Philhart. Oh, I, yes, I agree with that. And the first thing that you responded to after that email that started this dissolution is talking about him sharing issues about his mental difficulties. No, the first thing I said is, I'm sorry you feel this way. I mean, email speaks for itself. I'm not arguing that I didn't say what's in the email. Okay. Who is Kay? Kay was my former secretary. Kay Smith. And in that email, you also said, I didn't tell you to sell your stocks. And I don't know anything about that, correct? That's what I said, yes. You knew about him selling the stocks and you knew about is trying to sell stocks because you actually helped draft an email for him the year before, correct? I did not know that he had sold stocks or whether he had sold stocks. I knew that there was a question about stocks and the taxable consequences. And I helped him ask that question to his financial advisor, but I never knew that he did or didn't sell stocks. I didn't know that until, the, until we were in this process. So you had no discussion with him about how he was going to make that loan to you? about having to get rid of some stocks. That's not how this started in I, July of 2018. I don't remember him ever telling me how he was going to fund the third loan. Did he tell you why he was asking you to get advice from his financial advisor about selling stocks? I don't remember that conversation. Okay. There would have had to been some reason to spur you asking his financial advisor or drafting an email for him about the tax implications of liquidating stocks. You would agree that yes. it didn't just come out of the blue. Yes. Okay. You'd agree, generally speaking, that he repeatedly asked you for invoices and billing statements in his records during the time that uh, he was emailing you after February 22nd. Yes, and emails, that's correct. Okay. And you never responded by sending him any records or invoices or anything of that nature in 2019, did you? Uh, and other than providing them through uh, Adult Protective Services, I did not. And you did not provide, they did not provide them to him, correct? I thought they did, but I don't know if they did. You were they, present during the deposition of Michelle, of uh, Jennifer Riddell, right? Yes. And she said she would never do that, correct? I don't remember exactly what she said, but if she said that, I don't, I don't disagree with it. I don't dispute it. Okay. And he asked for his records back again in May after the Adult Protective, Adult Protective Services case was closed, May 24th and 29th. You remember him emailing you asking for his records back again? I, I can't remember all of the various emails. I know there were several emails. Okay. And we'll, we'll get into them in detail in a minute. You agree, he asked you many times for get his get invoices billing, records back and you never provided them until after the institution of the civil complaint in the JQC investigation. I'm, I'm trying to answer your question truthfully. I, I don't know if I can follow all that you're asking me, but- Okay, I, I'll break it down. Did you ever give him his records back after he asked? Yes. When? Well, all of his records, his full and complete record was provided after the litigation started. And after JQC investigator Lance Alford met with you and your attorneys. It wasn't until after that, correct? I don't remember the exact dates of those meetings and when things were handed over, but I know it was after the litigation. 
Before that, did you give Jim Philhart any of his invoices, billing records, or papers regarding the file? Yes. When? As I represented him and we went through the litigation, I was sending him correspondence and, uh, and, and filings and everything that was involved in his, uh, in his um, litigation. I sent it as it was produced and received by me. So I had sent all of those things to him over the time. And you say litigation, meaning the guardianship? Yes, sir, back in 2015 and 16. So everything that, that was in the file, I believed he had. And you, you gave him all those, you, you copied for him all those medical records and gave him the medical records at the time you received them. I don't know. I don't know that because that would have been something probably a secretary would have handled. Okay. But when he asked for his file and his invoices and billing statements, in 2019, you did not provide them to him, correct? Right. Well, and, and still answering your previous question, we had also provided some billing information for him uh, as we went through the process. Um, as you testified before, you provided him with one bill a couple of months after you started representing him on the guardianship and never another bill, correct? Correct. Until I provided it to APS in 2019. Does he work for APS? No. Okay, and after APS closed their investigation, he asked you multiple times again, correct? I don't know. Okay, we'll, we'll go into the emails. All right. But just to be clear, at any point did you actually provide bills totaling $80,000 for that partnership? So the bills, that, so the bill we provided in uh, well, I didn't provide any bills to him until uh, years later, until 2020, I guess, or 2019 or 2020. And um, you'll hear testimony, I guess I can tell you now. We, we at the end of the guardianship uh, litigation, Jim and I sat down and talked about um, finishing out his, his billing in the case. And... Um, when we sat down, I said to him, I haven't worked up your bill yet. I, he, he called me and said, or he, he told me, I want to settle this bill quickly. And so I said, well, I haven't worked up your bill yet. Um, and I said, what is it worth to you? What, what would you do just to let me be paid and not have to draft up the billing and, and create a, uh, an edited, accurate bill? And he said, um, well, I pay you $100,000. And I said, $100,000 is not reasonable. And we talked through it and we agreed on $50,000 as the final payment for that guardianship. And I told him for $50,000, number one, I wouldn't have to draft a bill for you. And number two, I would continue to help you going forward. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. And on that note, your own invoices show that you only earn maybe $50,000 in the guardianship, correct? Total. So I'd have to see the, the records, but. Okay, we'll get to them in a little bit. That's fine. All right, so you went to law school at UGA, correct? I did. Graduated in 1999. That's correct. Like us long suffering law students, you had to take that test about professional responsibility, the NPRE, correct? Yes. And you passed it. I did. And you had studied for it. Right. Okay. Um, also, professional experience. Um, you were sworn in in 1999, and I believe you told us before in deposition that you practice for maybe a year or two for a firm in Cornelia? Yes. Okay, just small firm doing kind of whatever walked in the door. Yeah, just kind of mostly litigation assistant kind of work. And after that, shortly after that, I guess 2001, you joined the Air Force JAG Corps, correct? <clears throat> yes. Okay, and thank you for your service. Um, I know it's you still are in, what's that? It's an honor to serve. And you're still in the reserves, correct? Yes. When you joined the Air Force as a JAG attorney, you had to go through JAG training, correct? Yes. And I believe you, you've told us previously two to three months was the training. Right. I think that's about right. Okay. And it wasn't like just going to a conference. It was all day, every day during the week, like a regular work week, correct? Like a work week, yes. Yeah, so 40 hours a week, five, every week for two to three months. Okay. Something like that. And during that time, you had training because as part of your job as a JAG attorney, especially the younger one, uh, you had training on how to draft wills in the states, correct? Yes. So even back then, you had specific training in that topic, correct? Right. We had training on how to use the program that was provided by the Air Force for drafting wills. 
and how to do it ethically, I'm sure, right? I'm sure we talk about ethics, yes. Because the military, you studied, you have a professional code of conduct for the military as an attorney, true, correct? Yes. Okay. And you had to study that in JAG attorney school, right? Right. And they actually have their own 1.8C rule about not making yourself a beneficiary of an instrument you draft, correct? I haven't looked at those rules for that purpose in a while. You would have looked know. at them back then, though, correct? Oh, yes. Okay. And as a part of your legal you work... Mean, do you mean back in 2001? Yes, back yes. during the time you were in your training. Yes. And then actually you began to utilize that knowledge you learned as far as representing or doing work for other airmen, correct? Right. We would draft simple wills as part of our legal assistance program to airmen. And you started off, I believe, in the legal office at Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina? Yes. And you were in the Air Force JAG Corps like I guess enlisted for that's the right term four years until 2005 I right on, I was on active duty status active. for four years yes and as you said part of that your duties there were to actually draft wills for airmen yes now you're not active duty anymore but you do work in the reserves yes. correct okay and during the past several years that you've done that, have you done uh, wills and estates, estate planning as well in that role to assist airmen? No. When's the last time you did it as a part of the Air Force? I really can't remember, probably at least 10 years ago. Okay. All right, after that you left and you went out into solo practice, correct? Yes. Okay. You, you have always been solo practitioner since 2005. Is that right? Until 2018, yes. Okay. And you've been the only attorney in the office. That's kind of the, the whole nomenclature of solo practice, right? Right. And you've had people like uh, administrative assistants and that type of thing come and go, but you're the only attorney. Yes. And your practice was, I guess you termed it a small town general practice. Yes. Um, and you mainly do did at the time when you were practicing until 2018. Um, you did mostly civil, you did some uh, domestic probate of estates and business contract disputes. You did all those types of things, correct? It was, it was a general practice, so yeah, I did. Lots that, of that always included some estate planning, uh, primarily drafting wills and trusts for existing clients, correct? Yes. You would have clients that maybe retained you for some purpose, but you would quite often do estate planning and draft wills and things of that nature for them, right? Yes. All right, I'm gonna show you Let me go ahead and pull up. I'm going to tender what's been identified as Exhibit 107 and 108 at this point, um, the applications for judicial office. Any objection to 107 or 108? Objection. They're admitted. Judge, you want to go to. <coughs> it's two applications because there was the Supreme Court application and the withdrawn Court of Appeals application. That's correct. Okay. And this is exhibit 107, page 14. You see that, Judge Coomer? Yes. Okay. And on that, in, uh, I guess, question 12, it asks about the general character of your practice, right? Yes. Okay. And then it states that yours is a bustling small town general practice, um, much as I described then. And in that, you also talk about uh, you've all, your practice has always included some estate planning, drafting wills and trusts for existing clients, correct? Yes. Okay. So even back... You noted that on your application in to the uh, Court of Appeals in March of 2018. And then again, you'd agree in Exhibit 108, you, you did the same thing. Yes. Okay. And you also handled business disputes, contract disputes, and those types of things as well. Yes. 
Um, during the time that you uh, have been running your law firm, um, the first time you ever ran for office, you ran for district attorney in your circuit back in 2008, correct? Yes. And that's the Cherokee circuit, not Cherokee County, but Bartow and is it Gordon? Yes. All right. And you filed a uh, declaration of intent to run. I think so. Okay. And you, obviously you had to raise some money to try to run, right? Correct. Okay. You had to file campaign reports. Yes. Okay. And you familiarize yourself at least generally with campaign finance laws beginning in 2008. Yes, I, I wanted to be familiar enough to file a disclosure. Yes. Right. Okay, and then um, you, uh, you didn't win in that race, but then you ran again in 2010 for state rep for your district, right? Correct. And what, what district is it again? I'm sorry, the number? 14. And that's part of, you got Cartersville and Rome in that area? Yes. All right, in 2010, you actually, you ran and you won uh, a seat in the House of Representatives. Yes. And you took office in 2011, correct? Correct. And again, you had to file a declaration of intent to run. Yes. I, and I during that time, know. over all those years, you had to run every two years, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and you did so until you left office in 2018, October 31st, 2018. Correct? I, I did. What, what are you asking me? I did. You. You, you ran consecutively for two year terms until you left office in October of 2018. Yes. And during those times, again, you had to raise money, correct? Correct. Uh, and you made expenditures. Yes. And then you also had to file campaign uh, disclosure reports uh, for those races. Yes. And you had to do it regularly. Right. There was a schedule for it. Yes. Okay. As a court of appeals judge, um, you were appointed uh, September 14, 2018, correct? Announced, excuse me, your appointment was announced then. I think that's right. And then you were sworn in on October 31st, 2018. Yes. And that's actually your birthday, right? Yes. Um, and you had to run for the first time in 2020, correct? Yes. And again, same question. You had to file a declaration of intent. Correct. Okay. And from the time you left, um, you moved from the House of Representatives to uh, Court of Appeals, um, for your campaign purposes, you used the same bank account, didn't you? Yes. Okay. okay. So you didn't switch to a different bank account after you went from state rep to judge, correct? That's right. And as a judge running for office, you had the same responsibilities as far as you had to file campaign finance disclosure reports and things of that nature, correct? Yes. And you're required to follow Georgia law when you did so. Correct. And then you have served in that position as a court of appeals judge ever since you were sworn in October 31st, 2018, albeit you've been suspended uh, for quite, a, quite some time now, correct? Yes. And your current term expires at the end of 2026. Yes. Okay, when you were in the House of Representatives, I mean, obviously there are a lot of members. Um, I guess the, the fraternity or sorority, whatever, of members who are actually attorneys too is not large. Would you agree with that? Correct. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as an attorney, you're trained in applying the law and looking at the law and determine, you know, interpreting and researching the law. You would agree with that? Yes. Okay. And you know that in following campaign finance laws, there are rules about reporting the amounts of contributions on your campaign disclosure reports, right? Depending on the amount of the contribution, somebody gives you money. There are certain, if it's over $100, then you have to actually report that contribution, right? Yes. And then also, as far as expenditures, you have to report specific expenditures, correct? Yes. And again, depending on the amount over $100, you have to report that, right? Yes. And you know, there are issues regarding aggregation and that type of thing regarding, you know, if you've got a bunch of little small things that are combined into one, you may have to report that. Well, as I understand aggregation, it's if you have several small expenses to one recipient, mm -hmm. you have to report that. Got it. Okay. And let's talk about end recipient. You have to report the end recipient of expenditures that you make, correct? Yes. And the sums of money you spent and the purpose to the campaign for those expenditures. Yes, which is all in the, the form, correct? Right. And you knew not doing so or not filing it accurately would be a violation of the campaign finance rules if you didn't do it right. Right. I, I, if I didn't do it correctly, 
that was going to be a problem. It would be a, vi a violation, which is why I tried to always get it right. And you also know that your expenditures have to be for ordinary and necessary expenses, right? Yes. And that has to be incurred in connection with your campaign for office or retention or fulfillment of your office as a state rep legislator, correct? Right. Excuse me? Sorry. Okay. 2018, um, Georgia law required you to file a CCDR. Can we call it a CCDR, the campaign yes. disclosure report? Well, I'm, I'm answering your question. Yes, we can call it that. I didn't hear your full question yet. I, I'm going to get that. You're good. We'll refer to it as a CCDR, if that's okay. Yes. Um, you know, at the end of the year uh, in 2018, uh, even though you were no longer a state rep but for a judge, you had to file a a campaign disclosure report at the end of that year, correct? I was a state rep in 2018 and I was a judge at the end of the year. And so you, you had, you still had to file one at the end of the year, correct? For which role? For 2000, for both of them? Uh, yes, because both of them had open campaign, uh, uh, both of them had open reporting requirements, yes. And you also, you filed a termination form at the end of 2018 in regard to your state. Uh, representative job, correct, or office. Do you remember doing that? I remember closing that one out. I think it was the end of 18, but if you want me to answer specific questions, I just need to look at it. Okay. We'll move on. That's not that important. Um, you would agree that as an attorney since 1999, at all times since then, you've been subject to the Georgia rules of professional conduct, correct? Yes. You talk about the bar rules? Yes. Yes. Um, and you agree that at all times you're a judicial candidate or a judge, you, as you are now, you're subject to the code of judicial conduct. Yes. As a, yes, as a judge, as a judicial candidate. Yes. And as you've always been required to follow the laws of the state of Georgia, right? Of course. And as a judge, you're required to familiarize yourself with and follow the code of judicial conduct, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and that goes back to, you know, you've had to do that going back to maybe even 2013, correct? 14, yes. Okay. And that, let get something cleared up. Um, you became a municipal court judge in Adairsville, Georgia uh, in 2013 or 14. You're, you're saying 2014, correct? Right. Okay. Um, when you filled out these applications, looking at 2000 and, or excuse me, Exhibit 107, you remember putting in there that you were actually uh, appointed municipal court judge in 2013? I, I don't know. I can look at it if you show Wait, me. Yes, that. I'll, I'll um, showing you. Okay, right there. I see. Yeah. Uh, I was appointed to serve in 2013. That's right. Okay. So would that be, I guess, would your memory have been better back then when you filled this out a few years ago or? Well, I'm reading it now. I remember it. I okay. Was, I was, do you want me to explain? Yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah. I was hired by the city council at the end of 2013. And so I actually sat on the bench for about three months of session, court sessions in 2014. Okay. So I didn't actually serve any judicial duty in 2013, but that's when I was hired by the city. And when in 2014 did you serve in a judicial duty? I, I can't remember the exact months, but they were not three consecutive months. Okay. Um, that, that's what I just wanted to understand because you know, just looking at it in black and white doesn't add up, but that makes sense. You would serve some, a month here, a month there, that type of thing? If, to the best of my memory, my agreement with the city council was that I wouldn't start serving until the end of the legislative session. Okay. I, I think that's what we agreed on. Anyway, it, it, was a, it was three months on the bench. And at some point in August of 2014, or the decision was August 2014, um, you queried the attorney general's office for an opinion as to whether or not you were actually allowed to do both, serve as a state rep and a municipal court judge. Yes. Okay. And in your query and uh, discussions with the AG's office, your position was that you were allowed to serve in both roles, correct? Yes, because and municipal, court, municipal courts were a different sort of animal under the constitution. There were some opinions out there that indicated you would be able to, Certainly some opinions that specifically said you could be a solicitor mm -hmm. of a municipal court and be in the, in the legislature. So I thought that, I thought it was a gray area and I wanted to get clarification. And the AG's office said separation of powers, you got to step down, right? Don't do it. And, and you did that. So I resigned. 
in preparation for that and becoming a municipal court judge, when you did that, obviously, even back as far as 2014, you familiarize yourself with the code of judicial conduct, correct? Yes. And as your attorney said in opening, um, you're familiar with the current JQC statutory authority and the uh, our process here, correct? Uh, yes. Because you actually helped draft the legislation um, for the constitutional amendment and then the statute that reconstituted the JQC, correct? I, I participated in that process, yes. And that was 2016, I believe, with the constitutional amendment and then the statutory change was 2017. Would you agree? That's probably right. Uh, and while you were doing that, um, working in that process, you also studied the Code of Judicial Conduct again while you were helping revamp the, the JQC. I don't remember if I studied the code at that time. We go back to 107 again. On question 28, on uh, page. All right, you're looking at the screen. Okay. Uh, in question 28, um, have you read and carefully studied the Code of Judicial Conduct? You talked about coordinating with Justice Namias, the governor, and Wendell Willard, rewriting the statutory um, authority. And then you stated, through that process, I studied the Code of Judicial Conduct in detail, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And then you also stated, I also studied it in preparation for my brief time as a municipal court judge. Yes. Okay. And again, looking at that, the continuation of this, you actually, in preparation for applying for that Court of Appeals judgeship the first time in March of 2018, you studied the Code of Judicial Conduct again in preparation for that. Yes. And you remember a deposition, you initially said that you didn't study. I, I don't, I'm sorry. Do, Can you ask me that? Do you remember being asked in the deposition if you had studied the Code of Judicial Conduct before applying or leading up to applying for that March judgeship? I, I don't remember, I don't remember what I said in the deposition. Okay. In any event, you admit now that you did. You at least put in your application that you studied the Code of Judicial Conduct in lead up to applying for that Court of Appeals yes. judge. Yes. All right. So March 29, 2018, you submitted exhibit 107. Correct. Well, well, I, I don't, I can't tell which one is which, but yes, right. I, I submitted a, an application. You did submit an application um, for the Court of Appeals on March 29, 2018. Yes. Okay. Um, and you knew. You know, I, I just mean I don't have a hard copy that has a label on it. That's why I can't. See. I don't remember if it's 107 or 108. But okay. But I'm not disputing. Okay. I guess the Exhibit 107 will speak for itself. Okay. Um, you agree that you knew when you filled out the application it was important to be truthful. Yes. Because okay, you're submitting it to a governmental agency. Yes. You signed it, correct? I, I did. And for that judgeship, um, you actually made the list of people to be interviewed, correct? They're, they whittled it down to 40 some odd people and you were on a list that you were gonna be interviewed by the JNC. Oh, yes, sir. And at some point, I believe around April 25th, you, were, you withdrew your name. It was before that, but I did withdraw my name before any interviews. Okay. Um, you would agree you, would, you were a judicial candidate during that time, between the time you sent in your application and the time you withdrew it? Yes. And during that time, you were actively in a financial deal with Mr. Philhart, um, having received a loan of $159,000. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you were also at that time serving an executor uh, of his estate under the May 2017 will. It was still in place, correct? No, that's not correct. 
Okay, so in March of 2018, the May 2017 will was not in place? No, the will was in place. I was not serving as an executor. Oh, you were, I'm sorry, you were named as the executor and trustee in the will during that time. Right. The will that was in effect at that time. Yes. And you were also at that time, uh, you had a power of attorney for Mr. Phil Hart as well. Yes. Okay. And you were also the beneficiary on a number of his financial accounts, correct? Yes. I don't, I didn't know about all of that until this litigation. So I knew about some of those payment on death accounts, but I didn't know the extent to which he had done that until we got into this litigation. And we'll get into the handwritten list, but you remember there's a handwritten list as a part of the May uh, 2017 will that um, says you're the beneficiary of everything? Yes. That was handwritten by Jim Philhart. Right. Yes. So even though you weren't technically the beneficiary in the will on his handwritten note, even back then you were the beneficiary of everything, all of his accounts. Well, I don't think that that handwritten list would have been controlling under that will, but he had certainly put that in a handwritten note. All right. And just, I think, Judge, I've got a couple of other questions as far as dates. I don't know if you, it'll be at a breaking point at that point. If you want to break for a while, I can keep going too. I, just, okay. I don't know what y'all's time frame is. We're like, I just, we had a longer break. Okay. Um, so I'd like to get some traction before we do break. For, we're not shortening lunch because you're going on. Um, so we'll, we'll hangs, stop soon. So, all right. Um, October 30th. So you went through your application or your name from consideration, but in October, on, on October 30th, 2018, you applied again for an opening with the Supreme Court. That's not correct. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna hand you this. Okay. I know it's a state, or excuse me, exhibit by the way. Okay. Okay, what is the title of the application? It, it says this questionnaire is submitted in connection with a vacancy on the Georgia Supreme Court. Right. So that was actually a Supreme Court vacancy that you were applying for at that time, correct? Yes. Okay. But you asked me if I had applied for it on October 31st. That was correct. August 30th, but maybe I... Okay, I mis maybe I but, misunderstood what you're saying. It's okay. Asking. No problem. August 30th. Um, and at this point, a short list had already been submitted of candidates that were under consideration, correct? I don't know. You don't remember? I don't remember. Okay. But at some point, do you remember um, the governor opening nominations back up? There was already a list and the governor opened nominations back up uh, for that position with the Supreme Court. That's correct, yes. Okay. And uh, you were one of just a few people who actually applied for it. Yeah, there were there were other people who applied as well. All right. And there was only there was one vacancy still open, correct? That's on well, the Supreme Court. Memory. Right. Okay. And did you were you asked to submit it or did you submit it yourself? I don't remember. Okay. All right. Um same thing before, you knew you had to be truthful, you were submitting it to a governmental agency, that type of thing, correct? Right, yes. And again, in that one, you I had discussed- had to be truthful just because I'm truthful, not because it was submitted to a government agency. Okay. Um, and again, in that one, you noted that you'd study the Code of Judicial Conduct as well in preparation for the application. Yes. And you detailed your uh, service as a municipal court judge and. I think it was identical in all respects to the Exhibit 107, except for the probably the title. Okay. It was pretty much cut and paste, you'd agree? Probably so. I don't know. I can't say 100%, but I, I think it's almost identical, if not identical. Okay. And you changed uh, the will with uh, Mr. Philhart in September, changing you from being executor and trustee to your wife because you knew you were going to be a judge, correct? Yes. Again, the appointment was announced on the 14th of September, 2018, or around then. And you, but you knew that this was a possibility before you were actually announced, correct? Yes. And you discussed changing the will with Mr. Phil Hart well before, some days before September 14th, correct? I don't think so. You remember, and we'll look at the invoices a little bit later today, but you remember in the invoices noting that you had charged or whatever it is, uh, Mr. Phil Hart for meeting with him about estate planning several days before your appointment? That's possible. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Okay. I guess what I'm trying to say is I would not have told Jim Philhart 
uh, if I had learned that I was going to be appointed, I would not have told him that before it was publicly announced. Okay. Well, how, why did you, what was the explanation for changing the will? What did you tell him? I, I don't, I don't have any memory of that. Uh, we, we changed it after the, after the okay. announcement. Okay. While we're waiting for the next question, may I ask you a question, yes, Judge? Regarding your campaign checking account, yes, sir. did you have one checking account continuously when you were a member of the General Assembly as well as a judge, or did you have two accounts? I had one account. And how did you separate that one account between the two functions? So what I did is at the end of my uh, time in the State House, as I, as I wound down to October 31st, I made an effort to account for all of and spend all of the campaign money related to my state house campaign so that I could essentially have a zero balance and not have uh, not have a bleed over from one to the other. I left uh, $6,600 in the account, which I believed at the time was the, the allowable amount I could transfer from one campaign to the other. And so when I so on November 1st or October 31st, I still had a $6,600 uh, balance essentially for the judicial campaign to start. So I didn't run both campaigns at the same time, really. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. For the next exhibits. All right. So oh, okay. going back to the getting on the topic of uh, campaign finance issues. Uh, as a court of appeals judge, obviously you have to run statewide. Yes. You, statewide jurisdiction as Correct. an appellate judge. Yes. Okay. And the first time you had to run for that office was uh, 2020, correct? Yes. Okay. And when you did that, you had to start filing campaign uh, contribution disclosure reports with the Campaign Finance Commission, correct? I think I started that in 2018 when I was appointed. And a lot of times it depends on if it's an election year or non-election year. Depend that that it, impacts when you file a report. Correct? If I could, I'm, yes, I don't remember when I started. I know I started before 2020. Okay, fair enough. Filing for the judicial race, right? And do we have? It's maybe easier for me to do it this way. Do we have access to turn it to the Elmo? Right, I'm gonna tender exhibit 109 at this point. Which is? It is a campaign contribution disclosure report. Okay. Um, and Judge, you, you did file one January 7th, 2020, correct? Or about that time? If, if you have a copy of it, I'll be glad to look at it. I, right. I don't have those dates memorized. You have that already? Yes, it was uh, tendered at deposition, 109. We didn't have it in what y'all disclosed to us, but it was in the deposition. Yeah, these were tendered at that. All right, 109 is admitted. Now I have to try to get my bearings. I knew I was gonna do it upside down. All right. hey, can you see that judge? Yes. 109, looking at this, this was something that you filed on January 7th, 2020, correct? If you'll let me see the top of the document, I could tell you a little further. Yeah, January 7th, 2020, yes. 
And that is for the reporting period of December 31st, 2019. Correct. Correct. We would have a seven day grace period, if my memory is correct. And you electronically filed that. Yes. And you either typed out information in it or had a drop down to select things, correct? Or I had somebody else type it in. Yes. And you verified this was all true and accurate. Right. Like you're ultimately responsible for filing these and the contents of it, correct? Yes. And you always went over it before you filed it to make sure it was correct. Yes. I went over it every time to try to make sure it was not incorrect. And it actually says, and we've discussed this before, down at the uh, bottom, that statement about it being, you, by, by filing that or hitting submit, that it is true, complete, and correct. Yes. And yes, and I, and I believed it was true and correct and complete at the time I filed it. And on this, um, this disclosure, you reported receiving or loaning yourself uh, or receiving a loan from yourself of $50,000, correct? Yes. I reported it as a loan because that was the only option available under the campaign finance uh, electronic filing form that, that matched what I was actually doing. So your answer is yes, you reported that as a loan? Yes. Okay. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but you know how to do an addendum to a campaign disclosure report, correct? Yes. And you know that there's an opportunity. If you need further explanation for what something means in the report, you know how to fill that out and explain it and say, hey, I need further clarification on this or I made a mistake. Yes, but I didn't think I had made a mistake when I filed that report. Okay. So you reported receiving a loan from yourself for $50,000, right? Yes. Okay. And it was a line of credit. Okay, so let's just get to the point. You never put any money in your campaign account from your, yourself. You never loaned yourself any money, did you? I never transferred any money from one account to another. Okay, and you are calling it a line of credit. Yes. Was this with a bank? No, it was, was from me personally to my campaign. Did any money ever change hands out of your account, your personal account, an investment account, or anything and go into your campaign account? No, it was a line of credit. Did you ever sign any documents affirming that you would make these funds available to your campaign? Did I sign? I, I did not sign a document from myself to myself. I did not. Right. Because it seems a bit absurd that you can just say, hey, I got $50,000. I'm going to claim that in my campaign account. I was Mr. <laughs> Kathy for the record. Okay. I did. <laughs> You agree that throughout this campaign disclosure report, you reported that you received a loan for $50,000 and that the campaign was indebted uh, a total of $50,000 for that reporting period, correct? Yes, I filled out the form that was provided by the Campaign Finance Commission, the electronic form, and it did not have an, uh, any option for identifying it as a line of credit. The loan is what seemed most like what I was trying to disclose and what I believed I was required to disclose. You understand a line of credit's an arrangement between a financial institution, you know, usually a bank, and a customer that establishes a maximum loan amount, and they pay interest, and it's secure. You, you get that, right? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. I mean, all I know is what I believed was I had extended a line of credit from myself to my campaign, and I had to report that. I, did, I, did, I had to make sure that it was clear that I made that money available to my campaign. So the entirety of your contribution to this campaign account, which is different than personal assets, you agree with that. Campaign account is different than personal assets. It's treated different. Yes. So you're telling us that you just made it up in your head that you would give $50,000 to yourself if you needed it, and you increased the amount of money in your campaign account by $50,000. No, I didn't. Report. No, I didn't just make it up in my head. I disclosed it on the campaign report. And again, we talked about, you know, there's a place where you can explain something if you don't have enough information based upon what they have for your, you to check off, right? Yes. Can and you didn't- show us what in the report reflects this? Yes. Yes, please. Um, the addendum part? Something that shows a $50,000 yes. loan. I understand it's labeled as a loan and yes. Judge Coomer has helped us understand. Look, that was the closest fit label that's mm -hmm. in there. I want to see what it looks like in the report. Okay. Page three. And on line 
two, it says loans received this reporting period, correct? On page three of the report. I don't see Am that. Am I looking at page three? It's on the screen, oh, yeah. Okay. Loans received this reporting period. Yes, that, that part was automatically filled in by the website. I didn't put anything in these particular lines. Before we go any further, Mr. Kathy, did you have an objection or you're standing? I didn't want to. Okay, you're welcome to stand. I just want to make sure you didn't have an objection. No problem. So, so I didn't, I didn't put any of this information on this page. I would have put information on a different page in the program that identifies the loan itself, how much it was, who it was from, and so forth. But you would yes, and we'll get to that. But this says <clears throat> what it says, and you inputted the fifty thousand dollars. Yes, that's right. And then total line seven total indebtedness at the close of this reporting period of time. You inputted the fifty thousand dollars, correct? Well, the the program auto populated this page, but I did put in an entry somewhere on the website that said fifty thousand dollars. Yes. I'll turn your attention to page. It's the next to last page, or next to next to last page of this exhibit, the page which says loan reporting. You see that? Yes. It says name of lender, Christian Coomer, and it has yes. your address, right? Yes. It says date of loan. Yes. Amount of loan. Yes. Election cycle. Yes. And you put $50,000, December 30th, 2019, primary 2020. You type that in, correct? Well, I, I typed in the date and the amount. Primary 2020 would have been a drop down mm -hmm. menu item I had to pick from. Of course, you know, this is another example of where the, the program's not exactly right because as a judicial candidate, I didn't have a primary, but that was what looked like the right option to select. Because you ran, as a judge, you run during the primaries, during those main races, correct? Right. Okay. And so all this says loan, loan, loan. At any time, did you say, hey, you know what? I need to make sure this is accurate. I'm not sending any money from any account to my campaign account. Um, I'm not bound by any of this. I'm just basically saying I got $50,000 outstanding somewhere and I could use it. I believed it was accurate based on the form that was provided to me from campaign finance. Okay. So did you say the form meaning what you filled out or did you get an opinion from the CFC saying it's okay to call this a loan. When I say the form, I'm referring to the electronic, the online form with the drop down options. And the only thing that looked like what I was doing was the option that I could select was loan. Otherwise, it was an expenditure or a contribution. Uh, so that was the only thing that looked like what I was doing. This is your, your best fit argument, as in yes. this was the best fit of the options that I, you were given. Correct. Correct. Just going to say that this time you didn't have a problem, correct? That, yes, that's correct. For, the, for your appointment case. Correct. Um, and just in my turn, typically you want your, your balance on your uh, campaign disclosure form to be as high as possible to potentially dissuade potential coming after you, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Do um, you think that if someone looked at this form, because these are publicly available? Yes, sir. They might think that you actually had fifty thousand dollars more in your bank account than you actually did. I believed I was under an obligation to report funds that were available to my campaign. The fifty thousand dollars was available to my campaign. If I had picked up an opponent, that fifty thousand dollars would have been used, available to be used in that campaign to try to uh, influence the outcome of the election. So it's interesting, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lopez asking that question about, you know, getting increasing your balance makes scares off opponents, right? I'm sorry, you're asking me if yes, that's not that, yeah. If you have higher, if you don't have an opponent, you increase your balance by fifty thousand. You may make somebody less likely to run against you. I I don't know that I agree with that entirely. Um, okay, just based on my experience. Okay. How does that differ from what you just answered from Mr. Lopez? Well. I mean, if, if you want to talk about specific examples, for example, in that same cycle, uh, Justice Bethel was up for election. 
he had a pretty good significant war chest. It didn't dif dissuade others from running against him who had significantly less money. Um, when I ran for DA, I had significantly less money than my opponent, but I still ran. When I ran for state house, I had significantly less money than my two opponents, but I still ran. So I, I understand the concept that if you, if you got more money on hand, that might make somebody else have a second thought about it. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that that is, that translates to an automatic win. Did I say that? I'm just, I'm just trying to be. Okay, no. Oh. And I, I say that because we just, do you remember me discussing this with you in the deposition? Uh, Asking you these same questions, basically what Judge, what Mr. Lopez said? I don't remember the, I remember we talked about it, but I don't remember exactly what you asked me. You remember saying that you did not think, and you disagreed with me, that having more money in your account was better to scare off opposition at that time. I don't remember. It would improve your chances of not getting somebody like I don't remember. Okay. I'll come back to that after the break. So under your theory, it would be perfectly okay for any candidate for state office in Georgia, let's say it's a, a billionaire, and they can put on their campaign disclosure, I had $8 billion in the account for my campaign because you say you have the ability to do it. Sure. Taking it to its illogical conclusion. Right. Overrule. So if you make money available to your campaign, you have to disclose it. That's the way I saw it. And you know, most people, if they loan their campaign, the money actually goes to the campaign or they take a lot of credit out from a bank. You, you understand Kelly Loeffler can't just walk in and say, my account, my campaign, I've raised and I have on hand $8 bazillion. That, that sounds crazy, right? I don't know how anybody else did it. I'm just telling you, I believed I had an obligation to disclose what I was going to make available to my campaign. And I did it the best way I knew how. Did your, did your mind change over the next four months? Maybe I'm only going to be willing to give 40K or 30K. Or, do you understand the public accountability problem with what you did? With disclosing that I was yes. making available $50,000 of my own money? Yes. I didn't know. I think it would have been worse if I had decided to make that money available and not disclose it. Okay. So do, don't you think it would have been more appropriate in the spirit of the rules and the campaign disclosures to have actually moved the $50,000 out of an investment account and put it in your campaign account? I, I did the best I could under the circumstances I had, the, the forms that were provided to me. You're good. You, you can transfer money, right? I'm sorry? You could have put $50,000 into your campaign account, correct? I, well, I could have if that's what I chose to do. All right. And at this time, when you said you were making yourself a $50,000 loan or making it available, um, I think you, you said in the deposition that this was the money you had in your UBS account. You had $214,000 at, at that time? I think at the time that I made that disclosure, I had $240,000. And um, this was after you received that letter from Mr. Gammon about the loans that you owed Mr. Philhart, correct? The November 7th or Correct. so yes. letter? Yes. yes. So you had all the emails from Mr. Philhart asking for his money back. You get a letter from Wright Gammon asking for the money back. You had over $280,000 in outstanding loans to Mr. Philhart, correct? I think that's about right. Okay. But you're just saying, hey, I got $50,000 somewhere. I could use it. So I'm going to put this in my campaign account. You're arguing now. You're right. Well, I, I, you don't need to answer. I apologize. He didn't really have a question. He was no. slipping into his closing argument. That would be correct. And I will slip back out of it. So, in fact, why don't we slip into lunch? Um, <laughs> we can, uh, you can figure out the next spot you want to go with um, during the lunch break. Um, it's 1230. Uh, any reason we couldn't be back here around 130 from the director's side? Uh, no objection to that. No problem. Mr. Kingman? Okay, um, then let's try to be back here as close to 1.30 as we can. Um, be at ease during the break and uh, we'll pick up then. Thank you so much. That's fine with me, I don't, yeah. I mean, I, I want them to be able to leave all their stuff and sort of come and go, that'd be great. I'll mute the um, uh, YouTube feed so you can talk and it won't go wherever it's been going. It is.
it's not, I was about to make it gay. Anything you want to go public with? No, no, no. Okay. Go and not be public.
Did you get lunch? I did. Okay. So you, did you eat yet, or are you gonna eat? Okay. All right. <laughs> We assume the position. Please. Ms. Johnson, are you ready? Excellent. I think we're ready. Um, let's make sure everyone else is. Mr. Boring, did you wash your hands after lunch? I did. Well, okay, good. Go ahead and call it. Oh, um, are you like ready to go? Period. I'm sorry. You're ready? I'm ready, yes. Mr. Kingma. You're ready as well. Fantastic. Then um, we will pick up where we left off, which is the director's cross-examination of Judge Coomer, who remains under oath after this lunch break. The live feed now has audio again. Um, there was video throughout, but we've turned the audio back on, and um, we can pick up wherever you recall leaving off. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Judge Coomer, I think we were, I uh, know we were discussing Exhibit 109. I was trying to put it on Elmo, but I found the digital version now, so we can, I'm not going to belabor it. I think we made our points before lunch, but just to verify, um, Looking at this, you can see the screen, correct, Judge? Yes. And as we discussed, um, this uh, exhibit, we, we talked about the filing. That's actually where the, the um, hearing panel can see the box where it talks about um, the statement being true, complete, and correct. Is that reflected on the screen right now? Yes. Okay. And looking at the second page where it talks about contributions received, um, on line 3A, it says all loans received this period $50,000, correct? Yes. And then total contributions to date. Um, and well, first it says total contributions reported this reporting period and the total is 78,326, correct? Yes. And the total contributions are 134,101, correct? Yes. And that includes that $50,000 amount um, where you reported it uh, on line 3A, correct? Yes. Okay. There, there was no $50,000 contributed though. Correct. No money changed hands and went to, into any account or out of any account. Correct. There was a fifty thousand dollar line of credit that I issued from myself to my campaign. So the answer is no. No money changed hands and went between any account regarding that fifty thousand dollars. No money changed hands. Okay. And when you say net balance on hand one twenty four nine thirty five, um, before that fifty thousand um, dollar addition, um, you were at I guess seventy some odd thousand dollars. Correct. It would be right, fifty thousand dollars less than that amount. So that that's a significant increase in the amount uh, net balance on hand. You would agree? It's an it's a difference of fifty thousand dollars. Would you agree that that's significant? Yes. Okay. All right. We already went over this page regarding the um, indebtedness, and then I believe we also went over what I am showing now as. It talks about loan reporting. We've already gone over that. And you listed your occupation as judge in Georgia Court of Appeals, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, we also discussed, um, just make sure we get to the end of this without anything else. Okay. Discuss the addendum. You're aware that there is an addendum in place on a campaign filing or campaign report where if you don't have enough room to explain fully what you're doing and what you're submitting in your transactions, you have somewhere where you can fully explain it, correct? I understood the addendum to be something if you needed to correct something on the form that uh, on a previous filing, you would file an addendum. Okay. I'm going to tender exhibit 112. I don't think I've tendered that one yet, which is campaign contribution disclosure report from December 31st, 2019. Did an exhibit list materialize over the lunch break? 112 is admitted. Yes, we did not print one, Judge. Okay. I believe we can actually maybe submit one via email to you all uh, here in a few minutes. Well, maybe, maybe not, but maybe on the break we can actually print it out. Okay. That would be super. All right. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I'm going to <clears throat> Publish 112 on the screen now. And 112 is another CCDR for that, a different date? That's correct, Judge.
And everything but 112 there. Uh, I did, yes, I can see that. I will pull it up in a different manner. There it is. Got so many pulled up. Um, all right, Judge, looking at this, um, this is a campaign uh, contribution disclosure report that you, uh, it's supplemental reporting, and it says December 31st, 2019, correct? Give me one second, please. Just on the front page. I'm sorry, what's your question? Um, this was uh, the date you checked off is December 31st, 2019, correct? Yes. Okay, going to the uh, last page. It says State of Georgia Campaign Contribution Disclosure Report Addendum Statement. Yes. See that? And the what it says there is the addendum statement should be used for explanation of any additional information needed to complete an accurate filing of this report, correct? Yes. Okay. And you never filled one out regarding um, the loan slash line of credit, correct? I did not. Keep these together, I'll take that back. Under Exhibit 110 at this time. It's a campaign disclosure report from January 31st, 2020. Any objection to 110? No objection. Admitted. Okay. See it on the screen now, Judge? Yes. Okay. This was filed on February 8, 2020, correct? Yes. And this was as a part of your uh, campaign for Court of Appeals, Judge, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, can you? In 2020? Uh, yes. Okay. And it says the... Uh, the reporting date is my election year, January 21st, 2020, correct? January 31st. 31st, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. And so on this, again, uh, it lists the total contributions to be $134,101. Yes. Okay. Um, the total for this reporting period, contributions, 134,221, correct? Contributions to date. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. And then net balance on hand again, 124,665, correct? Yes. And five cents. Yep. Okay. Yes. On the, again, the outstanding indebtedness, um, you've again, on the first one, outstanding indebtedness at the beginning of this reported period, you've got $50,000 on that. Correct. And then again, total indebtedness at the close of this reporting period, you've got $50,000 on that line as well, correct? Right. It would have just carried forward from the previous report. Right. And just basically establishing, you agree, you kept reporting this, uh, loan that was not a loan, correct? I kept reporting a, a line, line of credit, credit as a loan because that was the only way I could report it. And I mean, that's the way the campaign finance commission apparently saw it too. Explain that to me. Well, what do you mean? Well, when we, when we had this discussion and explained it to them in the end of their case, they dismissed that particular charge. Have you talked to the person as to why they did that? You know, people do things in negotiations, even though they may be able to prove it, in negotiations to settle a case, they may agree to dismiss the charge, correct? I, I'm sorry, I'm not, you asked me about- Did, did they say that you did not commit a campaign by finance violation? Uh, I don't have the language memorized in the consent order, but, but it's addressed. Okay, they chose not to proceed on it at that time. They chose not to proceed on it at that time, and they included language that said anything that happened before the date of that consent order was was not actionable. Was not what? I'm sorry. I don't have the exact wording, but basically, anything before that date was not something they were pursuing. Okay. Which would have uh, so, included this. Right. So they did not pursue this. That does not mean that you. They did not believe this was a violation of campaign finance law. Correct. You we can to talk to campaign finance believe, about that. But I'm just telling you, they alleged it initially, or they alleged it, and then they withdrew it. So we can get an explanation from them about that. Then. I'm sure you can. Sure we will. 
Okay, so again, you reported it on this one on exhibit 111, and, or excuse me, 110. And then I'm gonna put on the screen, I'm tendering exhibit 111 now, which is a campaign uh, contribution disclosure report for April 30th, 2020. Admitted. Okay, and Judge Coomer, on this one, again, you e-filed it May 4th, 2020, right? Yes. Okay. And it was for my election year, April 30th, 2020, correct? Yes. And this was the disclosure report, the first disclosure report you would have filed after having qualified for uh, the, the race for Court of Appeals judge, correct? After qualifying, yes. Qualifying and after having found March. out whether or not you were gonna have any opposition, correct? Right, qualifying was in March of that year. Right, and this would have been the first report filed after that. I think so. Okay. So I'm going to the outstanding indebtedness. Um, on this page again, line one, you have outstanding indebtedness at the beginning of this reported period, reporting period, and you have fifty thousand dollars, correct? Yes. And then on the line that says payments made on loans, this reporting period, you uh, would have inputted the fifty thousand dollars, as in that you had repaid that. Again, for payments made on loans. That's what this says, correct? I didn't add any information to these uh, rows. I would have input information about the retirement of that particular line of credit on a different screen, and then it would have populated to this automatically. So what you put the $50,000 in, you inputted it, and it would have gone into the payment made on loans for the reporting period. You would have seen that and checked off on that before signing that this is true and accurate, correct? Okay, and then going to the itemized expenditures. On uh, this one, you had a, a, it says May 6th, 2020, as far as expenditure date um, and expenditure type, it says loan repayment, right? Yes. And that was something from a drop down that you clicked on, correct? I think so. Okay. Um, then you enter judge and employer court of appeals, correct? Yes. And in the expenditure purpose, you've got the opportunity there to actually type in what the purpose of it is, correct? You yes. physically go in and type those words, right? I think so. Yes. And you typed the words retired debt, correct? Yes. Did you type any word line of credit? No. Did you type anything regarding what you've explained to the hearing panel here today? No. And again, you filed no addendum that gives you the opportunity to explain things you think may need explaining, correct? I don't think I filed an addendum. Okay. And that date of repayment was the day, last day of qualifying, right? Yes. The day that you found out you did not have a problem. Yes. Okay, so as a, a, we talked about this loan when you were, uh, this issue, uh, when you were a judge on the Court of Appeals, correct? Yes. Um, when we talked about it before a little bit, your time as a state rep, um, you're a public official, you have to run for office. We talked about all that every two years, correct? Yes. Um, and you actually um, opened a campaign account, correct? Back when you first ran? I. I open a campaign account at some point, yes. Okay. Show you, I'm gonna tender exhibit 113. Uh, that is the UCB account information that was tendered at the deposition. UCB is- <coughs> I'm sorry, United, United Community Bank. Okay. Admitted. And Judge Coomer, all of your, your bank accounts and things of that nature, those are all through UCB for United Community Bank, correct? Except for your UBS account. At that time, yes. Okay. 
at that time. Okay. And was that the main, the only bank that you banked at up until I guess the the filing of the lawsuit in 2020? Hold on. One point. Um, we, we don't object to its admission. And I talked to Mr. Warren before. Um, there are a number of account numbers that are still on these records. And he would ask that the final copy that goes in the record be kept so Judge Coomer's personal bank records and bank account numbers won't get subject to Or anything else. I noted on a couple other exhibits, it looked like we may have seen Judge Coomer's home address. I don't know if it was home or work address, but um, both sides will need to scour these exhibits before they get made part of the record that the court reporter will be finalizing so that we get no personal identifiers, date of birth, address, certainly um, no bank account numbers other than the last couple digits that make it clear this is the bank account we're talking about. So point well taken, but we'll rely on the two sides to um, look for those things. There was maybe a, a dispute over that. Um, our contention is that personal charges and things of that sort of personal records in its law firm account should not be in the record. I mean, if there are things that are relevant to this proceeding, you redact everything out, but that's what I've done with my records, redact everything out but the time of where he shops or where his wife shops for or whatever should not be in the record. That nature. Plus, there are pe other people's interests at stake with the law firm. So we would have to set for the items that are relevant. Mr. Boring. And Judge, uh, we had talked about redacting, like you were talking about, the identify identifying information. Um, we did on our new exhibits that we're going to introduce later. And we've done that. We've attempted to. There are some that we didn't, but we've talked about uh, getting together after this and get, looking at the record. If there's something that we can't agree on, then coming to your honor about a ruling on that, because I, I personally don't think on some of like the American Express car purchases and some other things like where he ate and stuff may be relevant. Um, but it also I don't think that there's any type of privacy concern or any necessity to have to send everybody in to redact every purchase or anything on a bank statement. Um, I get the 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 law firm account issue. Um, but I think that's something we can work through. And if we can't handle it, then we would come to your honor. Okay. Keep talking about it, but know that in general, just on relevance grounds, I think there are related privacy grounds. That's not an evidentiary objection, but right. it's a factor to consider. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how it would be relevant where Judge Coomer or his wife got yogurt, to use Mr. Lefko's example, um, unless there was some connection of, look, here is $500 from the campaign account and there was a phone call about let's go get yogurt and then it goes into the personal account and then they buy it. And I don't think that's other than Hawaii and Israel necessarily what you're gonna show. Understood, okay. All right, so, um, you know, Judge, you agree that the account ending in 5012 that we're gonna be talking about uh, is the, your campaign account and that you established that campaign account uh, back in, I believe it was, Trying to find the date. 2010. You opened it May 13, 2010, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and that is something only you were authorized to withdraw money from that account, correct? Yes. Um, you're the only ones that had access to make any financial uh, transactions via electronic transfer in and out of that account, correct? I'm the only one authorized to do that. That's correct. Okay. Um, sometimes you're, you're, uh, assistant, Kay Smith, or maybe Deborah Connolly, they may deposit campaign funds for you into the account, like checks and that type of name, that type of thing, correct? Yes. But you're the only one that was authorized to do anything else, true? Or the bank itself. Okay, gotcha. All right. And back in 2010, when you started this campaign, you were uh, in private practice as a solo practitioner, correct? Yes. And you actually received the monthly payments and statements regarding your campaign account, true? Yes. Okay. And I think, you know, the hearing panel member, um, Mr. Winter had noted and asked a question, clarified that you use the same account all the way through from state rep to judge. Yes. Can you, this, this has some personal identifiers on it right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, I guess that's not on the YouTube feed, so we don't need to worry about that. Okay. Um, I, was, I was taking it down just in case. Okay. Um, all right. 
we've talked about itemized expenditures and gone through that pretty ad nauseum. Um, when it comes to using a credit card as well um, with a campaign, uh, you used to use a camp, uh, an American Express card, correct? I had an American Express card, yes. And that American Express card, specifically um, the one that ended in digits 1006, you used that primarily for campaign purposes, correct? Yes. Up until October 31st, 2018. Yes. And uh, you understand that on a campaign disclosure report, um, you're supposed to put the end recipient, correct? As far as expenditures, when you expend something more than $100, you are to put the end recipient. Yes. And just as a matter of practice, during your time um, running for office and the time you were a candidate for judicial office up until October 31st, uh, you would pay American Express bills with your campaign funds and simply list miscellaneous expenses, correct? Yes. And you did that for thousands of dollars without listing what the actual final end recipient was. Correct? I did that. I did that routinely for several years. Yes. Okay. And so the public had no idea what you were using that money. For. Well, other than that, it was an American Express payment. Right. And you spent, I guess, during that time from 2015 to 2018, uh, almost $100,000 on your American Express, correct? I, if you say so, I, I don't have that number committed to memory. Okay. You'd agree. And the majority of that was you, you paid it off using campaign funds. Would you agree with that? Yes. And in that, there were times you were using making personal purchases as well, correct? There were some personal purchases in there, yes. And there were times you were using the campaign account to pay off those personal purchases. Every time I made a personal purchase, I made an effort to, to, to balance that out, to zero it out, either by a payment into the campaign account or a payment directly to American Express from non-campaign funds. And did you do that directly with something saying, this is for this expenditure based upon a personal purchase? Not every time, sometimes I did. Okay. Is my personal card. And the name on that account actually had Christian Coomer C-A-M, correct? Mm -hmm. And then Christian Coomer. Yes. And, and what was the C-A-M for? Well, it was, it was, my note to know this was stuff, this was uh, related to where I was sending campaign related purchases primarily. But if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the card that goes with it, the, the set up the account, it's my name, my social security number mm -hmm. was my card. Right. And you made innumerable purchases on your campaign with that credit card and then paid it off with campaign funds. No, they were not innumerable. They're all there on the record. On which record? On the American Express records. Right, but on the public record about what you spent campaign money on, that is not listed anywhere on the campaign records except for miscellaneous expenses again and again on yes, your campaign that's disclosures. Correct. Okay. That's correct. All right. Any other specific rules regarding using credit cards as a conduit for uh, purchases uh, with campaign funds, correct? I did not know that uh, until very recently. Okay. Uh, did you not know the definition of end recipient until very recently? I don't know that I ever looked at the definition of end recipient. Okay. And so you realize now that you were completely violating campaign finance laws by not following the rules regarding credit cards and the end recipient. Do you agree with that? I realize now that I should have included more information on those disclosures. I, I didn't realize it at the time and I never intentionally violated the campaign finance rules. Okay. You, you realize ignorance of the law is not a defense, right? I, well, I think whether I knowingly and intentionally violated the law is an issue at this, at this hearing. So you're a trained attorney, correct? I am. You can read the law. Sure. And do you, you know what the purpose of campaign finance law is, right? There to be accountability for campaign conduct, money that you're spending coming in and out of a campaign so the public can see. You agree with that, right? The, the trans... That accountability is the key of, or is the focus of campaign finance law? And transparency. So yes, so the public knows what you are spending those campaign funds for. Yes. Okay. And the way that you did your campaign disclosure reports, there's no way to tell what the heck you were spending the money on when you were using your American Express, correct? 
other than that it was an American Express charge. And of course I was doing that based on what I understood to be the right way to do it at that time. Okay. What brought you to that understanding since it sounds like you're now acknowledging, not that I knew either, uh, but you're acknowledging that the way you were doing it was the wrong way, but you said it was your understanding that it was the right way. What made you think it was the right way as opposed to just sort of guess? I, I looked at how other colleagues of mine were disclosing their expenditures and found that many were doing exactly that. Um, and of course I did that for many years and that was public. Uh, and I never got a call or an email from the campaign finance folks who look at this stuff to say, oh, you're doing this wrong. Nobody ever, ever said anything about it until, uh, until all of this has you know, come up in the last couple of years. Um, and in fact, I learned about the, the uh, end recipient definition regulation this weekend when I was looking at uh, exhibits that the, uh, that the commission was uh, gonna use in this case. I'd never read the, the um, definition uh, in the reg. And I, I, my lawyers are gonna tell me to stop talking now, but I'll tell you, I did look at the, the statute and it doesn't say anything about the recipient. And you agree that you're not allowed to use campaign funds for private personal purposes, correct? Correct. Okay. And, and you did that several times over the past few years, correct? Well, there were, there were times that I, uh, incurred expenses that were personal in nature, and then I reimbursed the campaign what I thought was appropriate for the uh, reimbursement. How many times did you actually reimburse the American Express uh, for campaign for personal purchases made with campaign funds? I, I I can't tell you exactly. Maybe a handful. Maybe I don't know. Less than ten, maybe. Right, a handful of times that you actually did that. Um, so, for example, let's just talk about the time, let's, September, October, 2018. Um, you go to church on Wednesdays? Usually, yes. And did your family go out to dinner after that? Uh, typically, we will have a meal somewhere, yeah. And you often went to El Nepal on Wednesdays, did you? Oh, yes. What's and it called? El Nepal. The Mexican, Mexican restaurant, restaurant in Adairsville, Georgia. It's in Cartersville, right? It's in Adairsville. Okay, Adairsville. Um, and so there's one in Cartersville too. But right. We but you, you prefer the other one. Well, you realize that you, you've made numerous purchases over the years, like $5,000 to El Nepal over three years span paying with campaign funds. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And the reason I did that is because, as you've already recognized, as a member of the House of Representatives, you're in perpetual campaign mode. Every two years, you're up for election again. So it was my practice uh, to have a weekly meal with people who are volunteers for my campaign, people who I knew were going to be involved in the campaigns, and go to dinner with them and pay for their dinner uh, as part of a, a campaign expenditure. And I did that. I did that for a long time as a candidate. And on the Wednesdays that you went with the family to El Nepal, was that campaign related? Yes. Okay. You you paid for your kids on campaign funds. Um, and your wife. Probably, yourself. yes. Okay. Do you think that's appropriate? Uh, yes, in that context. It's appropriate. In that context. How about stopping at Bojangles in Cartersville and well, picking up breakfast to, for yourself? You have to give me more detail. Okay. That. All right. We'll get into it. You would agree in looking at the Ethics Commission, um, you know, their investigation, they had reported a number of transactions that you did not disclose, correct? Say that again. There were a number of transactions over the years that you were running for state representative that you transferred funds. Let me be more clear. Specifically, you transferred funds out of your campaign um, without uh, reporting it on your campaign disclosure forms, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and you knew from, from having done it before, sometimes you would make a mistake in transfer, right? Sometimes, yes. And you knew how to note it when it was an electronic transfer that was done mistaken. Uh, I did that on a couple of occasions, but not every occasion. Okay. Do you know how many times that you failed to disclose transfers out of your campaign account? I don't remember the number. I want to turn to Exhibit 114. I think it was seven, but I'm not exactly sure. 
in all or seven in the formal charges? No, oh, seven. Well, I, I maybe I misunderstood your question. Okay. Just generally, there are a ton of times that you did not disclose transfers of money out of your campaign account, correct? No, there was not a ton. I don't know what a ton means, but but there were a few. Okay. Well, you know, the Ethics Commission listed there were at least 43 transactions where you did not report money coming out of your campaign. Um, are you talking about in the consent order or in their initial pleadings? In their initial pleadings and in our uh, formal charges as well. Um, were there 43 occasions where you did not disclose uh, transfers out? No. Okay. Um, By looking transfer out, maybe a term of art, is that an expenditure? Yes, an expenditure campaign going from the campaign account to another account, be it his law firm account or a personal account or to somebody else without disclosing it. Next question, real quick. Yes. So you mentioned that there are times you would make your volunteers to your campaign, you would buy the meal for the volunteers. Were there, were there ever times where you were paying for a meal where it's just you and your immediate family and no campaign volunteers were paying? No. So each of those expenditures and the pod were it included your kids and your wife, but it also included other ones. Yes, and if there were ever occasions when there were not other people besides my family, I would not pay with the campaign card for that. So exhibit 114, I'm going to tender that at this time. No objection. Admitted. All right, I'm publishing that at this point. Okay, um, Judge, exhibit 114, this is a campaign disclosure report from June 30th, 2015. Okay. And that is for reporting period June 30th, 2015, non election year. Do you see that? Yes. And looking at your expenditures, we've got through contributions, expenditures this time. Looking through it, I'm going to scroll through it. It says Alec, American Express, American Express, American Express, American Express, American Express, American Express. Um, so on and so forth, Bartow, County Chamber of Commerce, Georgia Republican Caucus, Quill, Quill, UGA Foundation, and UGA, okay. Uh, none of those uh, expenditures that you disclosed on this statement uh, disclosed any transfers from your campaign account to your law firm account, correct? Right. All right. Okay, and you, you've looked at the, the accounts now and talked with your attorneys about the, not going into what they said, but. You, in the formal charges that we have address certain transfers, correct? From your law firm, um, from your campaign account to your law firm, correct? Yes. Okay. On April the 15th, 2015, you agreed you transferred $750 from your campaign account to your law firm account, correct? You're going to have to show me something with a okay. date or something. Right. I can't remember all those. Okay. Um, did you look at those bank accounts that match up with that? The match up with? With what? the transfer I just talked about, the ones that are alleged in the formal charge. Did you go over that? I've reviewed all my bank accounts as far as I know. I, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here to unpack. I, I, I just can't talk about individual transactions unless you're going to show me something and ask me about it specifically. Okay. All right. Let me ask you this one I'm looking for. Do you have any um, explanation or what's your ex explanation or excuse for the um, transactions listed in the formal charges? or you've made transfers from your law firm account or your campaign account to your law firm account? Again, you have to, we'll have to go through each one because some of them have an explanation that might be that it was an, an allowable expenditure. Some of them may, there's an explanation that it was an inadvertent transfer. So okay. I mean, that's, that's a generic answer, but I can, I can talk about individual transactions if we have that information. If I have the bank records. Let me find it.
delivering. But there's no reason to have one that the CDR. Sorry, I got a ton of exhibits to go through to try to find this one. Judge, let me ask a question if I may, just while we're waiting here. With all these disclosure reports, you have acknowledged where there were some things that you might have done differently. Yes, sir. You had full knowledge of the procedures you were doing. Have you filed any amended disclosure reports? No, sir, we didn't do that. We we addressed it um, without filing amended reports. By the time we by the time we realized there was an issue, um, we were already in the middle of litigation with or in, in the middle of the complaint process. So we rather than filing amended reports, we went through the process campaign finance commission had already started. Let me see if I can find this in the complaint here. Okay. Looking at the tender at this point, exhibit 215, which is, which is the initial complaint filed by the Ethics Commission, which actually has <clears throat> exhibits attached to it. Okay, which we're calling the CFC as well. Okay, any objection to exhibit 215? Um, sure. This should be a document you're pretty familiar with. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah I just want to make sure. It has, it's the same objection that we have before. So I think it's admissible. Um, I think it may need to be redacted in some robust ways as although if the complaint was filed publicly, sort of shame on the CFC if there are things in there that shouldn't have been shared publicly, but those are out. We don't certainly want to compound any over disclosure mistakes that were made, um, but I'm going to admit 215 subject to the redact ongoing redaction discussions that the two sides will have. We're not acknowledging I mean, I don't think it's being offered for the truth of the matter as asserted in there. I think it's being offered for bank records. Is that correct? Yeah, oh. it, it is his bank record. So yes, it is admitted for the truth of the matter asserted. It's his bank record. So we're going to go into it since he's asked to talk about it. Well, I, I think the answer is yes and no. I, I don't think by this being admitted as an exhibit, anyone is admitting that the allegations in the complaint are true or anything like that. In fact, we on the panel have already heard that there's been some robust back and forth between Judge Coomer and his legal team and the CFC that resulted in some negotiated resolution. It sounds like we're going to hear more about that maybe from someone from the CFC at the appropriate time. 215 is admitted as a record. Um, it's going to show what it shows It's uh, and folks can be examined about it. Um, I'm sensitive to the redaction piece. For right now, we don't need to worry about that. But again, Please add that whoever's keeping the list of things that you're going to need to fly spec. I saw the judge's address again. So those kinds of things need to not be in what goes into the public record. And we're going to go through every exhibit that gets tendered and make sure we've got them, them all done before they're in the public. I'm record. sure your team is excited to hear that. They are super excited to hear that. We got we got new Adobe uh, materials, uh, makes it easier to market it out. So that's good. Great. Um, okay, Judge, uh, exhibit 215 is up right now. Looking at this. Um, attachment. This is your bank statement, correct? The account being that 5012 number there. Account number, do you see it? Business value account. What's that? I'm sorry. It's page 11 of it. We're on exhibit 215. Okay. And when you look at other debits, you see you have an internet transfer to 2219. That's your law firm account, correct? Yes. And that was on April 15th, correct? Yes. In the amount of $750, correct? Yes. Okay. Internet transfer uh, six days later, April 21st, 2015. You see that? Yes. And that's $500, correct? Right. 
then also, um, let's see. Looking at this on the bottom part with other credits, internet transfer from 5012, that's your campaign, to the law firm on the 15th, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, can you go to the top of this okay. page? Is this the law firm? It's, it's campaign to the law firm. This is just your law firm record showing the transfer. It's just showing back and forth, right? Yes. 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 So again, showing those transfers. What, it's what, the same two transfers, one showing right. it going from campaign account and the other showing it coming into the law firm. No, what, what, what they are is the first one is your campaign account number showing the money going from campaign to law firm. The second page was the law firm statement showing the exact same thing, reflecting those same transfers. Yes, it's the answer to your question. Okay. okay. Yes. There were, if you could go back to the law firm account page, so maybe just one page up where it showed the two transfers in or, or from. Uh, so... What is account 201? 2201 is a personal account. Okay. Yes. So these are all, it's just two accounts showing the same transaction, money going from law firm to the, I mean, excuse me, from campaign to law firm. But I just, so what we see on right here is a whole bunch of transfers from Judge Coomer's personal account into his law firm account. That is correct. And two from his campaign account, the two you're focused on, the two that are highlighted. Correct. That are from the campaign account to the law firm. That's correct. Okay. okay. And then I'm going to... When we're showing like these pages, like little clips of pages, I hope there's some transfer back. from the same. So Mr. Boring is going to share what he wants from the pages. If he leaves something out that you think is telling, you'll get to um, share those either with Judge Coomer or, or someone else. Okay. And so again, on June 22nd, or excuse me, May 22nd, looking at your campaign account statement, you made another transfer of $750 on May 22nd, uh, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> And again, just the your law firm account showing that same transfer, May yes. 22nd, $750. Okay. Now you actually did make a transfer back at some point, correct? Yes. Okay. Tell us about that. What, what do you want me to tell you? Um, how did you transfer it back? When did you transfer it back? What was the purpose? What what were the purposes of these transfers? How did they occur? Um, well, I can't recall all that off the top of my head as I sit here. I, I think we have some, I think I have some notes on that somewhere, but the, I know there was a, there were several transfers back. I mean, all of these were transferred back and more, uh, actually when I think on June 30th, by the June 30th, which would have been the reporting date, 2015. I'd actually transferred more into the campaign account than I had transferred from campaign account to the law firm. Okay. So looking at, and we can get into the weeds on this on, with the other witnesses, with the, with they've crunched the numbers, if that'd be easier, but you're saying some of these you transferred from your account to the law firm, were they mistakes? Again, uh, I, I don't have each one of these committed to memory. Some were, and, and, uh, and I've gone through and I've, I've, I've got some notes that I can look at to help me remember that, but I don't, looking at it right this second, I can't remember. Okay. Um, were you aware that on the 15th, uh, when you made that $750 transfer, um, what your balance would have been if you had not made that transfer? I'm sorry, on what, what day? April 15th. No, I don't know. Okay. You realize you would have had a negative balance if you had not done that. I don't know. Okay. Did you go back and compare it and look at your bank statements in that regard? I, I, no, I know that you've made some allegation about that, but I don't think I've gone back and checked that. Okay. Uh, April 21st, 2015, that $500 transfer, um, 
Did you realize you would have had a closing balance of less than $200 in your law firm account that day if you'd not made that transfer? I don't know if you, I mean, if that's what it shows, I'm not disputing that. May 22nd, um, that $750 transfer, you realize you'd had a closing balance of less than 200 bucks that day as well. Um, again, I, I don't have a committed memory, but if that's what the record shows, that's fine. And on one on exhibit 114, we talked about, um, you did not disclose any of these transfers to your law firm account on that day, correct? That's right. Okay. Because I had, I had reversed all of those transfers before the reporting period came around and I didn't think it had to be reported at that time. And these were not ones where you transfer, did you, did you send that money back immediately and transfer it back on these occasions? On the 2015, the June 30th, 2015, um, again, I, I can't remember without looking at the, the record showing the transfers back. Okay, so we should, we should talk to somebody who's actually crunched the numbers and done the data on that to be able to explain the money's transferring back. You didn't actually do that yourself, correct? No, you should look at the bank records that show where the transfers went back to the campaign account. Right. And so we should do that with somebody who's actually analyzed that, not you, because you have not analyzed that. Well, I have reviewed it. I just don't have it committed to memory as I sit here. Okay. Okay, going back to, um, I think we talked about 114, no disclosures of those transfers here. Um, exhibit 115. It's going to be the same line of questions here for the different allegations in the formal charges. Um, exhibit 15, back on uh, November the 8th. Well, first of all, let's talk about Exhibit 115. You want to tender 115? Yes, I'll tender 115 at this time. Which is another CCDR. It is another CCDR, correct. Submitted. If you want to tender all the CCDRs at once, great. Um, so that we can know that they're all okay, that'll streamline things. Uh, the tender states, or excuse me, exhibits 115, 116, and 117. They're all admitted. 115 is your. CCDR um, e filed January 6, 2017, correct? Yes. And that is uh, for election year, your December 31st, 2016 reporting period, correct? Yeah, I just noticed there's the wrong date on the top, though. Wrong. So today's date would have been wrong. What's that? Where it says uh, identifying and contact information, and number one is my name, number two is today's date. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think that would have been wrong since it was a 2017 filing. Correct. Anyway, it's just an error on the page. I just okay. and that that's your page, right? Yeah. You created this. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, again, going down to expenditures. I'm just going to scroll scroll through it. Um, looking at this. Did you see or do you see any transfers or reports where you've transferred money from your campaign account to your law firm? Uh, let me know when we've gone through this all. If you well, see. These, these are contributions. Oh, these are contributions. contributions. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, yeah, this, it'll way. probably make it quicker if I get to the expenditures. So. Either way, I can tell you that. Yeah, the, you didn't do not it. on the disclosure. OK, same thing for Exhibit 116, Exhibit 117. None of these you never, ever disclosed any transfers from your law firm to, I mean, excuse me, from the campaign to the law firm, correct? So I can't, I don't want to answer some extremely broad question like that because there were a, there were a, a few transfers that were made and corrected and I did not disclose those on the, on the campaign reports because I didn't believe I had to. Okay. And the ones in the formal charges, those, those five different transact or five different CD, uh, transaction CCDRs, um, the ones that were involved in the formal charge and amended formal charge, you had never disclosed those specific transactions on your campaign campaign disclosure reports, correct? In, in your charges or in the campaign finance charges? In the amended formal charges and the formal charges of the JQC. Okay. Um, I just, 
I think in those charges, right. I, your, your question is, did I disclose those on the CCDR? Correct. I did not. I'm going to turn to, um, you've been asked earlier the name Kay Smith. Right. And who is Kay Smith? Kay Smith was my uh, assistant, my secretary for a couple of years in the law firm. All right. And in the law firm, did you, did you pay her regularly? Like, how did that work? She was, I think she was an hourly employee and she got paid regularly for her work. Mm -hmm. And would you, um, how did you pay her? Via what mechanism? There was a program called, or there's a company called Paychex mm -hmm. that um, managed that, and she would go in and put in her time, and Paychex would pay her. They would debit mm -hmm. from my law firm account and pay her. Okay. And so when you paid her, was it like in an hourly rate? I think so. Okay. And did she also do uh, any type of work for your campaign? Yes. Okay. And tell me about that. Well, she, she did a lot of different things for the campaign. She uh, helped with volunteer coordination, I think. She certainly wrote or uh, prepared letters and communications from the campaign, answered the phones for the campaign. Um, she would come to the Capitol uh, from time to time. And, and I'm saying campaign, it's really campaign and legislative work, both. Mm -hmm. uh, she'd sometimes come to the Capitol and, and help with constituent services. and. Um, she was always wearing, the whole time she worked for me, she was always wearing two hats, both and, the law firm and the, and the campaign or legislative functions. And with the work with the campaign, did you pay her out of campaign funds? Uh, no, I, I paid her, all of her, all of her, her regular monthly pay came from the law firm. Okay. And so um, I'm gonna show you on the tender, Exhibit 227, and that is a bank account statement 229 of your law firm for uh, statements October 31st, 2018. So it's one month of a one month statement Correct. for the law firm bank account. Yes. Any objection to 227? Objection to 227, just the same continuing. You have it. I'm sorry, what, what month was this for? Uh, October 31st, 2018 was the end date. Okay. Okay. So look, this statement is the statement of your bank account. Yes. And it's for, from the law firm, again, you have, I believe, got to find the right page. Okay. Looking right here um, where it says toward the end, Paychecks Incorporated Payroll, and it's got those numbers on October 19th, it's got uh, a payment of $531.37 Paychecks Incorporated Payroll, right? Yes, and also one for $130.72 on the same date. The for taxes? Yes. Okay. And that was a payment to K. Smith, correct? Yes. From the, from the law firm? Yeah, that would have been her pay for that period. Okay. And then also on the last page of that statement, um, also you have paychecks incorporated payroll, $1,088.69 of payment made via the same thing on October 30th, correct? Yes, and also $361.23 on October 30th. The, the accompanying taxes? Yes. Okay. And so those were those would have been payments from the law firm to K. Smith for law firm work. Right. Okay. And I'm showing you exhibit 228, or I'm tendering states exhibit or exhibit 228. Which is going to be a campaign account statement for uh, the same day, the same statement date, 103118. No objection. Did it?
One second, Judge. Okay. Looking at the bottom of this page on Exhibit 228, you see this here, K. Smith reimbursement for 10-19-2018, correct? Yes. For $531.97. Yes. And not the taxes, correct? Correct. Okay. So you, you paid out of your law firm $531.97 to K. Smith uh, that had been paid out of the law firm, correct? Yes. And of course, we had the, the payroll cost above that, mm -hmm. the other taxes portion. Right. And so... Um, that was not reimbursed from the law firm or from the campaign, correct? What was not? The taxes. Right. Okay. So you use campaign funds to pay for work from your law firm? Yes, for this, uh, for, for this period, that's correct. Right. And you did not report that on your uh, disclosure report, did you? That's right. That okay. was, was an oversight, and it's something that I admitted to making a mistake about. Okay. You specifically went in and made this transfer, and you said K. Smith reimbursement, correct? Yes. Okay, how was that a mistake? No, it was a mistake not to report it on my campaign disclosure report. Okay, um, but you're not allowed to pay her for her work with the law firm completely when she's doing work closing down your law firm, uh, paying her entire pay with campaign funds, correct? That's right, I didn't do that. Okay, you did do that? I did not do that. Okay, um, is there another payroll one on this one? Uh, Payment to her? I don't know if it's on, I don't know if it's on this one. Was there another one on that same statement or were these the only two payments, the $500 one, uh, excuse me, the 531.37, yes. okay, and the 1,088? Yes. Were those the only two in that statement of that month payments to her? Um, I'd need time to review it again. I, I don't know, Would I, I guess looking at it real quickly, I, I don't see another one right now. Okay. So all the work that she did during that time at your law firm, you paid for with campaign funds, correct? No. Okay. How else did you pay her? Well, I'm saying that I, my law firm incurred expenses above just these base payroll amounts, which mm -hmm. included the taxes. Mm -hmm. So it was more payroll expense to K. Smith than just those particular dollar amounts. I picked those dollar amounts because K. Smith was working for she was working in the law firm, but she was also doing additional campaign slash legislative stuff in October of 2018. Okay. And um, she had done it like I testified already. She'd been doing it for years and I'd never had the law firm reimburse. I never had the campaign reimburse the law firm for any of her expenses over the years until she, this one payroll. And you did it two different amounts, correct? I did it what's right here. Okay, and there are no other payments from your law firm to her. All the payments to Kay Smith for her work in the month of October was from that payroll app, and then all of it was reimbursed, but for the taxes from your campaign, correct? Yes, I, I think that's what we just went over. Right, so what money from the law firm was used to pay her in October? What money from the law firm? That was not reimbursed by the campaign, yes. I just explained that there were both the hourly rate cost and the pay the the taxes uh, cost, and we I, I used the payroll amounts to pay to reimburse the law firm from the campaign. As I just did that as a sort of back of the napkin way of dividing it up. I thought, well, you know, got this much total expense. Kay's probably done this much in, in, in law firm and this much in uh, political. This looks like a, a good balance for this month. Um, but again, I'd never reimbursed the law firm for all of the political work she had done over the years. So this was like payback. I'm sorry. You're making up for the money that you didn't pay for the campaign previously. Well, I thought it was legitimate for that month. And you didn't report it. I'm sorry? And you did not report it. Correct? That's right. Those, those were not reported. Okay. Um, you also, on December, let me find the dates. No, excuse me, October 26, 2018, uh, cut a check to K. Smith, correct? Yes. $2,718.36. Correct. Okay. And you wrote that check to K. Smith, correct? Yes. And you actually did disclose that on your campaign report. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. And you wrote on the check constituent services and reimbursement. Yes. So that is in addition to what you paid from the campaign to the law firm and did report. You wrote her another check for $2,718. Yes. Okay. And you realize, you know, Kay Smith was mostly winding down your law firm, right? You weren't doing any campaign events in October. That's incorrect. Okay. So if she said differently that she was spending most of her time uh, winding down your law firm and was not involved in campaign events, that would be incorrect? I think she was involved in campaign related activities in October and beyond. So, and you remember at deposition, um, you said that some of this money um, for constituent services, this was money you were paying to her for some future unknown work that may be done for another candidate, correct? Yes. So, well, I, would, I, didn't, I don't know if I said it that way, but, but I said it was for future work. Right. And when I ask you for who, it was not for your campaign, correct? Correct. It was for some other candidates. You really couldn't even give me a name other than your dad, possibly she was going to do some work. Well, it was work that she was going to do for his campaign mm -hmm. and work that she was going to do, I believe, for there were two candidates from Paulding County who were also running at that time. Um, and I can't remember the names of those two candidates right now. Okay. What was your father running for? State House. And, and shall I go on? Up to you, I just asked what he was running. For. Okay, well, so my, my politically, my job at the time was to be the majority caucus whip. That was, I was elected to that position by my colleagues. Part of what you do as a majority caucus whip is you send help to other campaigns of other people running in your caucus. So I sent help by the way of Kay Smith to those other candidates who were running at that time. I wasn't going to be the majority whip anymore, but I had this this uh, set of campaign funds that have been donated and I could use it for that purpose. And so I used it for that purpose to pay her to go and help other candidates. That's part of it. There was also a reimbursement. There was a reimbursement and constituent services. What was the reimbursement? Uh, there's a, there's a reimburse, reimbursement form she filled out. I don't remember what it is. Okay. I'm that, confused though. This, I thought this is 2019. Is this 2018? It's 2018. 2018. 2018. Yes. Okay. I'm less confused. Right. Her time for her work that she was doing for the law firm, what she did for the campaign, was she, was she keeping time for you? No, she just worked in the law firm and whatever she put in for whatever hours she put in, she put in the law firm and the law firm. But she put it to the pretext. Right. How she about, didn't delineate between campaign work or law firm work. So some of that work could have been campaign work. It was definitely campaign work. Some of it. Okay, let's talk about um, the the trip to Hawaii that you and your family on. Okay. Okay. Um, Initially, you would use campaign funds for the flights, upgrades, and then on the trip, you used it for... Before you, yes. before you start asking this line of question, would it be all right if we take a, a bathroom break? I'm, I'm guessing this is going to be a long set of questions. If you need a bathroom break, Judge, we should do that. Okay. We'll keep this one kind of short. It wasn't quite um, afternoon break time, but uh, let's try to be ready to go. Um, no later than 250. I'm staying right here, 255. Okay. okay. Thanks. Can I ask, can you just stand? I mean, in normal court, when y'all get up, is that okay? Don't stand for me, stand for him. You, you do not need to. <laughs> <laughs> However, you want to work with them, by the way. Um, if we're going to talk.
Judge Coomer, we're going to get started. You'll come on back. He's trying to find his cheat sheet on these transactions so he's not. Yeah, I don't know if you want that phrase on the record, but uh, <laughs> you can do what you need to do. It's been 10 minutes, so we're starting up again. Well, they, apparently that one place called the Sweet, whatever it is, I just helped us out with that. Or you could do that federal judge thing. I was calling. <laughs> I don't think it works here for some reason. You're calling from where? <laughs> That's not part of the U.S. <laughs> you have no power anyway. I can put it on the screen. What number? Oh, I already got it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. Yep. Okay. We are, Ms. Johnson, you ready? She's ready. Great. We are back on the record after our early afternoon break. Um, Judge Kumar remains under oath. I think we were about to get to the chapter about Hawaii. Unless you're having to rewind a little bit. I do have one thing that I may help clarify the previous like 20 minutes. I'm going to um, mark this as exhibit. Mark this as 253. So you are able, just so we don't need to panic, you can go up to 299. Correct. And you have to put on the brakes and leapfrog to like 500. And if you get that, that, I do not anticipate that. That's good news. Yes. 253. So 253 is, would be something new. Correct. Okay. It is, yes. And so actually, uh, tendering this, it's actually a demonstrative provided by uh, Judge Coomer and his team because I figured he would understand this and going through it. So well, I hope there's no objection to 253 then. Yeah. Okay. 253 is in. Okay. Judge, I'm going to publish this. If Your Honor can put this on the, uh, the Elmo. I'll try this again since I don't have this in digital form. <clears throat> okay, can you see that, Judge? Yes. Looking at this, this is a demonstrative aid created um, by your attorneys for use in this case regarding your transfers back and forth from your campaign to law account, correct? Yes. Okay. And, you know, we were discussing this. Obviously, you didn't have the bank records in front of you for us to go through and talk about your transfers, when you transferred it to the law firm, and then when you made a transfer back, correct? Correct. Okay. Does this help refresh your recollection about the specific uh, transfers in the case uh, involving you and your campaign and your law firm that are also in the formal charge? Yes, this will help me remember the dates of the transfers back and forth. It doesn't have any anything on it that will tell me the reasons for the transfers. Okay. Um, looking at this, starting in the first one, we talked about the April 15, 2015 transfer as well, correct? Yes. Okay. And you transferred $750 on that uh, occasion, correct? Yes. And I asked you the questions. You don't remember what the balance was or anything of that nature and how this may have floated um, a possible negative closing balance. You don't have that in front of you, correct? That's right. Had you looked, and you haven't looked at any of that to see what that actually reflects in the bank record yourself independently, correct? I, I haven't looked at it recently enough to be able to answer questions about okay. it. Um, so the day after this does have, you transferred the same amount back to your law firm, I mean, to the campaign the next day, correct? Yes. Neither one of these transfers were on the campaign disclosure report, correct? That's right. Um, April 21st, 2015, uh, that's the $500 transfer from the campaign account to your law firm. Yes. Okay. And this reflects that you actually uh, transferred $2,000 back on June 30th, 2015, correct? Yes. And that is 
a month and a half after this, correct? Yes. Again, May 22nd, 2015, another $750 that we talked about that. You transferred that from the campaign to the law firm. Yes. Right. And again, your, your, your answer to the questions about you knowing what your balance or your law firm account on all these questions, you don't have a clue, correct? Right. Okay. There was just one payment of $2,000 back to the law firm, back to the campaign account on 6-30-2015. That is correct. Yes. And so that's that one payment on June 30th um, that was made after the April 21st and the May 22nd, 2015 uh, transfers, correct? Yes. Okay. And again, those were not, that, that transfer back and forth, you did not put anything like that on your uh, campaign disclosure report, correct? That's right. I would have, so June 30th was a reporting date for mm -hmm. campaign uh, disclosures. So on June 30th, I would have looked, uh, I would have been preparing my campaign disclosure report and realized I had these transfers that had been made and not corrected or reversed. And so I decided to reverse them uh, before the reporting period so there wouldn't be anything to report. So you had made those transfers, though, and not reversed the money back until your campaign reporting day. And right. I did, that's, when I, that's when I realized I had those outstanding transfers. Uh, November 8, 2016, you made a $1,000 transfer from the campaign to the law firm, correct? Yes. And then the next day, again, you transferred 1000 back. Yes. And that was another occasion. You, well, you don't know what your balance was at that point. Right. Okay. Uh, February 14th, 2017, you made another $1,000 transfer to the law firm. Yes. And then the 15th, you made another transfer of $1,000 to the law firm. Yes. And then uh, you transferred those back on the 17th. Correct. Okay. And again, you don't know the balances of your law firm. That's right. Uh, March 7th. You made two transfers, two separate ones, and two distinctly different amounts, one of $1,000 and one of $1,200 from campaign to law firm, correct? Yes. Okay. And then the transfer uh, you made back on March 8, 2017, you only transferred $1,000 back on that day, correct? That's right. And the reason you didn't is, transfer, there was not a corresponding $1,200 transfer. I could answer the question. Let, let, so let Mr. Boring finish, because you started before he was done, and then Mr. Boring will need to wait until you're done. Okay. So Apologies. you only paid that $1,000 back, not the $1,200, correct? That's right. And the reason for that is because I didn't know I had made the $1,200 transfer from my campaign account to the law firm. It was an inadvertent transfer. I, it, I was probably doing it on my phone. And I uh, intended to transfer money from a different account into the law firm account for $1,200. So I, I didn't realize I had made that transfer um, until much later. Until these proceedings. Un, until, until I got a, a, a complaint from the Campaign Finance Commission. I, I have a question for you, Juan. So you're distinctly remembering one, yes, 1,200. Yes. Oh, that must have been a mistake, which says to me, the other one on that same day, the $1,000 to the law firm from your campaign account, one, you remember, two, wasn't a mistake. Am Correct. I misapprehending your response to Mr. Bourne? No, sir. I, I, my testimony is on March 7, 2017, I would have intentionally transferred $1,000 from my campaign account to my law firm account. Okay. That was not unintentional. Okay. However, the $1,200 transfer was unintentional. What was the purpose for the thousand, purposeful $1,000? Well, you recall when I first started looking at this, I said, I, I, it doesn't tell me the reasons. I've got another document that tells me the reasons I'll be glad to talk about. But so I don't remember this one in particular. I know that there were, there was a, um, a campaign incurred uh, payroll expenses all the time. I could have, and, and in fact, I have a history of having been, having made uh, payroll expenses reimbursed by the law firm and that was legitimate. Um, and I could have done that here. Uh, I'm not saying that that's what that one was for, but that may have been, it, may have, it was probably a reimbursable expense that I've used to justify that particular transfer. So la last question for me, what is it now that makes you sure that the thousand was purposeful and the 1200 was inadvertent? So 
as I got ready for this hearing, I, I, I did my best to review all this and go back and look. And I realized that um, I had, I had uh, in my personal account, you've already seen, I transferred money from my personal account to my law firm pretty frequently. And I know from looking at the records that in 2000, on, on that date, I had uh, in excess of $1,200 in my personal account that I would have transferred over to cover whatever law firm expenses were, were there. So, so I, I believed at the, I'm, I'm reconstructing this part. I don't have an independent memory of this. My best estimate is on 3-7-2017, I intended to transfer $1,200 from my personal account to the law firm, which explains why it was not reimbursed because I didn't realize I had done it incorrectly until we got into litigation. Thank you. But even with that, as it shows, I, then I had a I had a, a balance due of four hundred and fifty dollars on the transfers. Aside from payment, what other reasons would you have to? Utilities, internet, telephone, um, printing costs, postage costs, everything was. Uh, do you have documentation showing what those costs were that could correspond to these amounts? I have, I have documents showing the expenses for those things. I just for for uh, internet service and utilities and but phone the service. I ask is these, these amounts are a thousand dollars. Right. You get a two hundred thirty dollar utility bill, two hundred fifty dollar other kind of bill. It's just they don't usually add up to perfect. Thousand, 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 right. Thousand. So that's why you have bills that correspond to these that, that show these amounts. No, sir. Okay. And in any event, you never disclose this on your reports either. That's right. Okay, looking at, skip that. I don't know why they put that July 17th on there one. Um, okay, I think we talked about the transfers back and forth, those that we've alleged in the amended formal charges of the JQC. Um, again, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Hawaii now a little bit. Okay, when you went to, you, you took this trip to Hawaii with your family, you, you intended that initially as a vacation, right? No, I intended, well, I intended it for, be, for it to be a mixed use trip in which there would be some business purpose and a personal trip. When you bought the tickets, you had no business purpose at the time, did you? Uh, I, rem I don't remember that. I know that I intended to have a business purpose when I took the trip. Just some theoretical campaign government work there? You were going to buy the tickets to Hawaii and then figure it out? Is that what you're no, no. telling us? No, my, my purpose was to go and look at, I mean, I never intended for this whole trip to be a campaign financed trip. That wasn't what happened. It wasn't our intention at, at any point. I intended to add a business purpose that would justify some level of reimbursement or some level of, of defraying cost, but that did not happen. It fell apart. And so it wound up being a completely personal trip. When you use the term business, you mean campaign or yes. developing your law firm practice? So it would be business as in the tax return? No, or... sir. I mean, I mean, campaign legislative. And, and in this particular case, it was more legislative than campaign. So you initially bought tickets uh, on June 9th, 2018 to Hawaii, correct? I think that's right. Let's just be clear about it then. Then a tender exhibit 219 at this point. We have this nice exhibit list from Judge Coomer's side, but 219 is not on it. It's from, it's a uh, director's. It's one that we did not share within deposition. It's in our list that we will get to you. No okay. Oh, we did? Okay, great. Are you, by the way, are you going? 
Excuse me. Are you doing just two nineteen? You have a series of annex statements. Correct. Are you doing all? Oh, I'll tender them all now if you want. Yeah. No um, tendering right. two nineteen through actually for the purposes of this cross examination two nineteen through two. What was your highest number? Two fifty three. What's that? Not all the way through. Two nineteen to what? Two twenty six. No objections from Patricia. All MX statements. Uh, no. There are also, um, let's see, there are <coughs> emails uh, and text messages as well. How about this, all Hawaii related? All about this. Yes. Okay. They're all admitted, 219 through 226. So looking at uh, 219, uh, Judge Coomer, this is a uh, statement, closing date, June 26, 2018 for your Amex account ending in 1006, correct? I don't see it. We're switching over, it was on the- Oh, I'm um, sorry, yeah, it was on the Elmo. Yeah. It switched over, I don't know that you're- I don't know, press it again. See what happens. We'd had it on the other one for a while. JQC, not the. All right. So the can, defense one works. I can yep. plug it in and try again. Do the whole unplug and plug in. And see if that works. Okay. This is your first time trying at the lectern. No, I, we've actually had it. Been using it up here from the lectern. Oh, okay. So. That's all right. I can do my own exhibits. Thank you, Judge. I'd, I, can I answer uh, Judge Lopez's? He had asked me a question, and I'm sitting here thinking about his question about specific uh, expenses. And if I could, there are some corresponding expenses to some of those charges. There are some, like there's a seven, I know, I can't tell you which one off the top of my head, but I know there's, for example, a $750 payroll expense that came out uh, that would have been about the same time as a $750 transfer. We're, we're good. I forgot you were at the lectern, so I've been trying to turn on oh, okay. your table um, and not the lectern. User error. Thank you. I can't tell you which ones of those are, which ones go with which, but there are some of those. All right, uh, Judge Coomer, now looking at this uh, exhibit 219, this is um, your credit card statement account 1006, uh, the closing date, June 26, 2018, correct? July 21st, 2018. That's payment due. Look at top left, closing date. Yes, yes, June 26, 2018. I'm scrolling down to the uh, purchases made on the credit card. Okay, looking here, um, June 9, 2018, you see several purchases, correct, to Delta Airlines? Yes. And those were the purchases for your airline flights to Hawaii, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, one for Heidi, $998.20. Right. The one at the bottom for, um, it says Vivian, is $998.20. Yes. And then $11.20 for uh, yourself and the other kids, correct? Yes. Okay. And just you know, for my own edification, like, why, why is it? Why are those those amounts for um, uh, the kids and you for eleven twenty? Is that just use sky miles or something? Yes. Okay. So the total um, is a little over two thousand dollars for that, correct? Right. Okay. And this is the uh, account that you use mostly paying back with campaign account, correct? Yes. Now going to Excuse me, sorry. I'm gonna to go to 220 to that. Okay, this is your closing date, 72718, correct? 
yes. July 27th, 18. The next statement. Okay. Okay. And your payments that time, looking at that statement, you made payments from uh, uh, from your campaign account in four thousand five hundred ninety-two dollars, and then you made two other payments: one from your law firm and one from your uh, personal account to the Amex that time. Correct? Uh, there were definitely two payments there from non-campaign sources. Okay, and that was made on July thirteenth, two thousand eighteen. Correct? Yes. So you didn't pay, you know, using the Amex, you didn't pay out personal funds immediately for that exact amount of the ticket purchases for Hawaii, correct? Back in June, you didn't, there wasn't a corresponding, okay, you bought the tickets and then you're using personal funds to pay it off immediately on the Amex, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And on this one, actually, there is no corresponding amount of a payment from personal funds or anything like that in the amount of your ticket purchases, correct? I'm, I was... Um, you didn't get to finish your answer. I didn't. You oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. What was the end of your last answer, <laughs> Judge? I wish I could remember what I was saying. I, I was, I was. Uh, oh, yeah. He, uh, the question was that, that these weren't immediately repaid, and I was just saying that it was paid in the following month in this instance. Okay, and I knew you were going to claim that this. You've got a payment of five hundred and seventy five hundred seven dollars and forty three dollars or cents. You would agree that's a very specific amount, correct? Is a specific amount, yes. And one thousand eight hundred thirty dollars and forty cents is a very specific amount, correct? Yes. And none of those are anywhere near correlate at all to the amount that you spent on the tickets for Hawaii, correct? As I'm sitting here looking at this, I I can't tell you how I came up with those amounts, but I probably have something in my notes. Oh, isn't it true that you actually reimbursed for the five tickets in October of two thousand eighteen? <laughs> I know I made an additional payment uh, or two in October 2018. Yeah, you have a payment specifically that says reimburse for tickets for June 9th, 2018. Oh, yes, a, like a transfer to the campaign account from another account. I think. So okay. I, 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 I know there's something like that. All right. So these, these amounts don't have, they don't look to have anything to do with your purchase of all things, correct? Well, I can tell you that's what they were intended to reimburse. How you tell me that? How, how can you tell me that? Well, just so we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Are you referring now, Judge Coomer, to the two figures on the screen? Yes. Or are you? Well, I'm, I'm saying that those. I'm sorry, go ahead. Because it sounds like you, there is a reimbursement from you to your campaign account. Why would you also then pay MX? Two different two different payment or two different times. This one was like back in July. This was about the time of the purchase of the tickets. And so that payment was intended to go toward whatever those expenses were at that time. Um, Why would they end in the, um, Judge Lopez was asking you when you had a thousand dollars and that was reimbursing for internet and postage, things that don't end in zero, zero. Right. These, <laughs> actually are specific. They don't end in zero, zero. $507 and 43 cents. I'm not asking you to remember now what that ties to, but, but that's a very specific payment and it doesn't match up. If you add up the airfares that we just saw, it's a number much larger than that. It doesn't end in a 43. Right. I think, I hate to guess, but I can tell you, we, I have an answer for that. If I, if I could look back at the previous month's statement, I might be able to shed some light on it now. If not, then I'll be able to address it later. It sounds like it'll be later. Okay. All right. And so you agree those amounts don't match up at all to the ticket purchases, correct? I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean when you say match up to. The, I don't know if they're the... They match up to something that's mathematically... Uh, uh, makes sense. I just can't tell you as I sit here what that is. You remember at some point you actually did um, make a payment, specifically paying back that exact amount, at least for the 311.20 and 1998 purchase. I don't know. You remember that? I don't understand your question. Okay. Looking for the actual reimbursement now. Do you remember making a specific 
uh, payment on the credit card or to the credit card from your uh, personal account in the amount of three of those $11.20 tickets plus one of the $998 tickets. I don't remember it. Looking for that exhibit now. Bear with me a second. No members. Okay, looking at actually what's already been admitted as exhibit 228, um, your law firm, or excuse me, your campaign account statement uh, from October 31st, 2018. You, you looking at that? Yes. Okay, you see specifically on your campaign account statement, months later after you purchased those tickets in June, you have a credit where you reimbursed your campaign account. It says reimburse Amex expense for tickets on June 9th, 2018. Yes. You did that on October 4th, a few days after getting back from Hawaii, correct? Yes. And that is in the amount of $1,031.08, and eight, $31 right? Yes. And that is the exact amount of the $311.20 purchases and the $998 some odd dollar purchases, correct? If you say so. I mean, do you disagree with that? I, I don't, I'm not, I can't do the math that fast, but it looks about right. Okay. How do you get a bank statement to say something like that? <laughs> yeah. Do you have to? Do, well, do you do you manually enter that back in to reflect? Oh, I'm reimbursing this uh, charge that I took out with campaign funds and paid for with campaign funds back in June or July. So what I what I learned, Judge, is that you in in uh, with this account uh, at some point I don't know when, but at some point I gained the ability to be able to put a description in there like that and and uh and so obviously i did put that description in there for that so that if i was sitting on a stand in cobb county one day i could say <laughs> yeah that was for june 9 2018 tickets very forward looking oh so, yes and that was four months after you actually bought the tickets correct it the reason it was paid then is because the trip had taken place it wasn't canceled, so I knew that the expense was there, but also because by that time, the, the, the legislative purpose had evaporated. So, so there was no question that I needed to pay, you know, for the trip. Do you think you should have paid for your kids, too, as well, um, going to Hawaii when you were going to try to find some <coughs> campaign legislative event? Yes. You think you can take your kids? I, oh, I misunderstood your question. Okay. I, I thought you were asking me, should I have personally paid for my, my children's airfare? As opposed oh, yeah, to yeah. You should have done that, right? Yes. And you repaid it in October of 2018, a few months later, right? I, I think I, again, that was a payment. That wasn't the only payment that I made toward this trip. You're, you're trying to count the stuff again back in July when you had those two payments somehow correlating to your expenses for Hawaii. Is that what yes. you're saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you evidently have some way you can show that. Yes. Okay. All right. So, so you just testified that at this point, the legislative purpose had evaporated. So, right. did not exist. So, why did you uh, reimburse the full amount, which I think was $2,030? I'm sorry. I understand your question. So, you reimbursed your campaign $1,031 to accept one ticket for nine ninety eight twenty and the three tickets for eleven twenty. Yes, sir. Right? Uh -huh. At this point, there was no purpose for your campaign to pay any of those tickets. 
So why didn't you reimburse the full three thousand seven dollars? Because that was part of what was reimbursed in the July uh, payments. The uh, 50743 and the 1840 Yes. Because at that time, I still expected that I at least would have a, for myself, would have a legislative purpose to be there uh, in part. And I hadn't figured out what that percentage would be, but in the end, it didn't matter. It all had to be paid back. And your ticket would have been $998. So you paid everything back, but that $998. I just, October. I, I don't remember uh, how I did the math other than this is the cost of one ticket plus the three um, $11.20 charges. So it would have been one last $998 ticket that you did not reimburse this time. Right. Okay. And you're trying to say that that payment back in July of 2018, that was somehow correlated to that 998 or something like that. It, it was correlated to expenses for the Hawaii trip. Okay. And that was in July. To the best of my knowledge, I mean, I have obviously I'm not looking at those statements right now. My memory is that that correlates to the Hawaii trip expense. Okay. And so we have talked about um, I think exhibit 219 and 220. 219 being the purchase of the tickets, 220 being uh, the statement where we don't see any. I mean, I get your point, but there are no payments back from any non-campaign account that correlate to the amounts that you had already spent, correct? I'm sorry, say, please say that again. On this statement in July, there are no payments back. I understand you're trying to say that, you know, you, you were paying it uh, the, the, for the purchases. All you had spent was the two $998 tickets and three $11.20 tickets at this point, correct? I can't say that because I can't look at- All right, here. Exhibit 219, all you had spent on Delta tickets on June 9th, 2018, you spent $998.20, correct? Yes. $11.20. Yes. $11.20. Yes. $11.20. Yes. $11 right. And $998.20, correct? That's right. So out of that 1031 some odd you paid back in October, there would have been $998.20 left from there, correct? Uh, Yes. And then looking at the next corresponding uh, statement. Can you go to the bottom of that statement just so I can review it? Sure. Just tell me when to stop. Okay, that's fine. Okay, anything else? Uh, the next statement. Okay, July. This is the one we're talking about where you made these two random, very definite amount payments. You would agree that none of those correlate to either the combined amounts that you had just spent the month before or to $998 that is left after you paid in October, correct? What I would ask you to do is scroll down and let me look at the charges. Okay. Can you have that exhibit? I don't have a problem with that if oh. anyone has it. It's fine with me. Can I approach, approach the witness? Yes. And if you need to go to a specific uh, place, Judge Coomer, just let me know. So this Priceline car rental of 712 2018. Mm -hmm. That was probably a rental car for that trip. Mm -hmm. So that's the only other expense that I see that might have corresponded with the amounts. But again, I can answer that more fully when I have a chance to review my records. Okay. And are these the same records that um, your attorney I mean, supplied my, my to me? My notes that I have cobbled together from looking at these over the years. So <laughs> You've referred to these notes by the fifth time. Is there a reason you didn't refer to them before you were called by the director, but you will have referred to them when your lawyer calls you? 
No, I just don't have it with me right now. Okay. <clears throat> so we have looked at 220, 221. Um, I'm going to that's already been tendered to. Um, have you looked at that enough to know that you didn't make any other payments back in that statement? Or from a personal account? One second, please. And I'm publishing on the screen that statement, closing date 8 27 18. Go to the payments section. Okay. All right. Looking at 221, um, you see that in account summary, previous balance, you had a $720 credit. Um, payments, you made no payments this time, correct? That's correct. So there would have been nothing you could contribute to having paid off any of the previous. Uh, initial tickets, correct? Uh, I, I, I don't really understand your question, but I don't see any payments made here. Okay, good enough. Um, looking then, scrolling down to your purchases, um, on August 13th, well after that July payment, um, you made several purchases and upgrades in your flights, correct? Yes. Um, $209 upgrade charge for Heidi, um, 215 some odd for Colin, another one for Heidi, another one for Vivian, another one for uh, you, and another one for you. You had seven charges altogether for upgrades, correct? Okay, yes. And then that was to move from, to be able to choose your own seats, I believe, and then um, to actually, I think your wife and one of your children, did, did you get an extra upgrade to assist them? I don't remember. Okay. In any event, you've got over $1,400 in upgrade charges you spent this time, correct? Yes. And that was all, you used campaign funds to pay for that, correct? Yeah. Uh, I used the, the American Express card and then the campaign reimbursed. Yes. So yes, the, the end recipient, the payment was from your campaign to pay for your Hawaii upgrades, correct? In August of 13. That's right. Okay. And... Looking at exhibit 223, this is closing date, October 26, 2018. Looking at these, there's a couple of expenses. The dates on there are 010118, Fat Boys Coco Marin. That's Hawaii, correct? Yes. And while the date says January 1st, 18, those would have been purchases while you were in Hawaii, correct? Yes. And what were the dates that you went to Hawaii again? Was the end of September, I think, through the 1st of October, early October. I think it was maybe November 22nd through October 1st or 2nd. Would that sound? It sounds about right. So looking at this, you've got expenditures um, in Hawaii, numerous uh, purchases for gas, for food, for parking, um, food again, go-go in-flight, other, I guess that was other Delta purchases, uh, October 1st looks to be when you arrived back. Um, made a lot of purchases in Hawaii on the Amex, which you reimbursed and which you paid for with campaign funds, correct? Yes. Okay. And you know you're not supposed to do that, correct? Well, I later reimbursed them, but yes. And you, re you later reimbursed them after you were investigated, correct? Well, I made reimbursements um, shortly after the trip was over um, and then made additional uh, repayment after the campaign finance case started. And the reimbursement you're talking about after the trip is over, that's what we've already talked about, that $1,031, correct? Yes. No other reimbursement after that, correct? Uh, I, I don't think that's correct. Okay, what other reimbursements did you make uh, for the Hawaii trip after that? 
Well, before the camp, well, after the campaign finance commission's investigation began, I made a, a payment of $5,000 to Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation because I didn't know at that time if I would have some shortfalls with regard to some of these uh, expenditures. We had just hadn't gone back and done an audit. I thought if there's a chance I'm gonna owe something, I'll just pay it up front and then we'll go through and figure out what there is. And so I, I paid that money um, after the campaign finance investigation began, but before we had ever uh, figured out where the shortfalls were. Why does <laughs> giving money to AVLF address the concerns you thought CFC might have? So because the state, these were state house campaign expenditures, the state house campaign uh, was closed. It was, um, I, I didn't have uh, an avenue for paying it back to the campaign itself. Campaign expenses, one of the ways you can disperse campaign expenses after, the, after a campaign is over is you can give them to nonprofit organizations. So um, we paid the money to Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation, which is a nonprofit, in lieu of being able to pay it directly back to the campaign. The 5000 came out of your campaign account? No, 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 my personal funds. Okay, because you couldn't put money into your now dormant, you're not a legislator anymore. Right. Okay. And, and your understanding is that the, and someone else maybe testified to this, that the CFC would view that as a way of repaying. You can't pay it into the closed piggy bank, it's not right. open anymore, but it's a way of giving it back, if you will. Yes, because any of any campaign funds that I would have had left over, I would have given those to a charitable organization. And that would have been 2020, correct? Two years after your trip to Hawaii? It would have been in 2020. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in 2020. And if the Ethics Commission, a Campaign Finance Commission, started their investigation and gave you notice in October of 2020, it would have been about two years since you took the trip to Hawaii, correct? If you got back from Hawaii in October of 2018. Yes, yes, I'm, yes, I'm sorry, I, I would, the dates were jumbled in my mind, but yes, so 2020 is when the Campaign Finance Commission filed charges. And just to be clear, complaint. And, and when you went to Hawaii, went on this trip, and you were a judicial candidate, had already been announced to be appointed for the Court of Appeals, and were uh, awaiting to be sworn in at the end of October, correct? Yes. And just so we're clear, and I don't have to go into any more statements, you did not pay anything back other than that 1,031 we've already talked about uh, for the Hawaii trip, reimbursements, food, I mean, upgrades, food, any of that until 2020, correct? Plus what I had paid in advance in July. The, the two random amounts. Right. Okay. When you were in Hawaii, did you have another credit card with you or was the only credit card you had the campaign credit card. I had another credit card with me. This Amex card there's your personal card, right? It was. Okay, it's not, it's, this wasn't a campaign card. That's correct. It, it, yeah, and it had campaign on it and you used it for campaign purposes, but it wasn't like it specifically tied to your campaign account, correct? It was, it was, my, it was my credit card in my name on my social security number. Okay, yeah, but I, I wanna, I, Understood, but my understanding, because it was Christian Coomer, C-A-M, the purpose of that credit card versus another one, which you said you had, would be, I will typically use the Amex for things that are related to legislative work, campaigning, et cetera, but my kid wants an ice cream cone. Here we are at a beach in Hawaii. I'm going to pull out my visa because there's nothing about that ice cream cone that is legislative work or campaign related. So you you may actually have two Amexes, but let's make it easy. Your visa is your other one. You pull out your visa and put the ice cream cone on the visa card. Is that generally how you operated or you sifted through each month? Like, wow, I don't know, Dolly Parton's stampede, that's gonna be personal, but P.F. Chang's, I think I remember that was campaign. 
So since you pointed out after October 31st, every expenditure after 31st was personal, okay. not campaign at Got all. It. So Dolly Parton Stampede was not paid by the campaign. Um, but, um, but to your point, uh, generally I tried to, to keep those uh, discreet. Um, in the month of October 2018, as I'm getting, you know, kind of winding down, I got sloppy. Uh, and that's, that's, I mean, it's not, that's all I can say about that. I got sloppy. I intended to, I intended to always do what was required under the regulation, the statute. And um, I did that to the best of my ability. I just got sloppy at the end. Thank you. And when you made those purchases, those upgrade purchases of $1,400 in August, that was well before you had applied or were appointed to the Court of Appeals, correct? Yes. So was that just sloppy? No, the reimbursement was sloppy. Okay. And the, and the use of the card on the trip was sloppy. And again, you did not, and I'm going to tender exhibits 118, 119, and 120 at this point, the campaign disclosure reports for June 30th, 18, September 30th, 18, and October 25th, 18. No you agree, you never... Did. You never disclose these trips and paying even the campaign funds to pay for these trips, correct? Okay. 118, 119, and 120. And those are more CCDRs? Correct. Out of CCDRs. And you never disclosed on a campaign report that you use campaign pun funds to pay for a trip to Hawaii, correct? Correct. I only reported that it was an Amex expense. Okay. Along with a bunch of other expenses that you paid on your Amex card with campaign funds, correct? Yes. Now you talked about you were trying to get a set up a legislative trip or something to have a, you know, to to I guess be able to use campaign funds on some of it for some of your trip, correct? Yes. You already decided to take your wife and your kids to Hawaii. Yes. Before you had anything even before you even tried to set anything up, correct? I don't remember the timeline. Okay, well, you provided us with some emails and text messages, correct? Yes. You think that'll help you with the timeline? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna tender exhibits 225 and 226 at this point. Yeah, they're in, you got oh, they are. 226. I'm sorry, oh, they were, yes, I'm sorry, we already tendered these, yes. Okay, 225, um, Publishing 225 now said you provided us with a number of emails uh, regarding your trip to Hawaii, correct? Yes. Okay. And so the first email that you provided us was an email dated July 13th, 2018, correct? Yes. That's the same day you allegedly made these repayments or you made these random payments with personal funds to the Amex card, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, this is the first day somebody had reached out to you about going to tour, um, a, visit a Kaiser Permanente facility in Hawaii, correct? Um, can you go up, please? Yeah, sure. Or, or down, which down. is. Yep. Okay. That's it. So the first thing you provide us is July 13th, a month after you bought the tickets, and you got an email from somebody talking about possibly trying to set up a trip to Kaiser Permanente to a hospital or facility, correct? Can you go back down just a little, please? Sure. Okay, yeah. So is uh, that correct? That was, this would have been after I'd had conversations about trying to make this trip work. Okay. And when would you have those conversations? Prior to July 13th. So at this point, you, you, you had nothing set up, no trip set up that was any way involved with your legislative campaign or official duties, correct? I did not have a trip. I did not, did have, not a have a visit or anything set up. So please make sure you let the witness yes. finish. Okay. I did not have a trip set up at that. I mean, I did not have a legislative function set up at that time. And you responded that same day, great, thanks very much, correct? Yes. Then after that, um, Shay Ross got in touch with you from Kaiser Permanente um, about connecting with Helen and George, uh, about your interest in visiting a facility in Hawaii, 
Uh, and then she told you she was gonna try to coordinate something for you, correct? Yes. And then also um, love to coordinate setting you up with a tour of one of the Georgia facilities, correct? Yes. Then you responded that on the same day, later that day, this weekend, I'm performing National Guard drill. Um, and you talk about other things you're doing, a mid trade mission to China trip um, in that, uh, you're looking at about three weeks out before you can make anything work for a meeting and you just tried to stay in touch with her, correct? Yes. She responded, that's good. She gives you her phone number. Nothing at this point still is set up, correct? Right. You email back on September 25th. You're already in Hawaii, correct? Um, when I emailed this, yes. Yes. But there were text messages. Yes, and we'll go into that. Okay, so exhibit 226, it's already been tendered and admitted. Um, text messages. Okay. So in between that time, between July of 2018, and then that email, of September 25th, when you're already in Hawaii, you engage in several text messages with a person to try to coordinate these uh, trips, correct? Yes. Or this tour. Yes. Okay. August 6, 2018, um, you get a text from uh, someone from Kaiser about having spoke to the team and asking if you have time to talk and have a quick conversation, right? And then you said you're in mediation, but can call back this afternoon. Yep, yes. And so you're trying to get together um, and talk. August 8th, three days later, um, she texts you, or this person texts you, just following up, want to touch base regarding your Hawaii tour. Let me know when convenient. Yes. 23rd of August, um, she messages again, spoke to their Hawaii GR team yesterday regarding the visit. They're inclined to do a tour of a Kulawa clinic as it is better, representation of rural clinic in Oahu. Um, and they she talks again about um, trying to set up the tour. And then she also says she wants to extend a bit invitation for you to actually tour uh, with Car uh, Chairman Cooper at uh, KPMG's Georgia Taver Town Park location. See that? Yes. Okay. You ask the address of the clinic. And she gives you the address. Yes. So between that time in August, there's no conversation again. Then September 4th, this person texts you back, just wanted to follow up with you on the location change. Would you like me to go ahead and coordinate it? Um, you said, please hold off a few days. I need to see if I can make it work. She says, sounds good. I'll be in touch early next week. September 14th, she, the person <laughs> again reaches out to you. Hi, Representative Coomer. Any further thoughts on the KP Hawaii tour? So this is a week before you leave. And you said, I really don't think I can make it work to go down to Kana. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that correctly. K-A-N-E-O-H-E -E for the tour. If a tour is of the other clinic, is it an option? Then we can pull the plug, no harm, no foul. So at this point, you still don't have a tour confirmed or anything official in Hawaii, right? Right. And then they say, okay, let me circle back with KP Hawaii and be sure that is the case. On the 19th, you reached so out. I, a, I mean, sorry. I, I, yes, go ahead. We had the other clinic available. I was trying to make it work for a different location, but I assumed that if it didn't work, we could always go back to this one. Basically, you said pull the plug on it, right? I did, yep. Oh, well, I said we could, so we could pull the plug. So, so again, there was no definite, even one official visit to uh, anywhere in Hawaii uh, at this point, correct? Yes, there was one. You actually had a confirmed. Correct. Oh, OK. Um, then you ask again on the 19th about it, about anywhere in the visit. Uh, the person says, sorry, this has been strung out. Let me call KP Hawaii now and find out they are set and wanting to do that specific tour. Sorry, it did not work out. Congratulations on your appointment. And then you talk about, OK, I understand. Thank you. Trying to get all the education I can before my current job, before moving to the next one. But happy. Very happy for the next one. Um, and then she says, makes sense. If you ever want to do a tour in Georgia, I'd be happy to assist. September 20th, you send a text again. I think I may have crossed up wires about the locations. So here, um, you're telling her you could actually do a tour at that specific location. Um, you're sorry for the confusion and that type of thing, correct? Yes. And then she says, sure, can you give me the dates and times? And at this point, you are actually flying at that point. Yes. Um, couldn't check your itinerary, thumbs up, 
And then you said Thursday, 27th, nine to 10, let me see what I can do. Still, you didn't have anything firmly set up at all for an official visit, correct? Right. And then you did not do any tour of anything related to Kaiser Permanente or any official business in Hawaii. That's correct. Okay. Just to confirm, I think you said this, that, that $485 for the rental car, that was also um, for Hawaii, correct? I think that's correct. And you, you, have you looked at your attorney's demonstratives and they've included it in there as an expense for Hawaii? I don't remember as I sit here. All right. Um, I know in addition to that, back in 2017, you took a trip to uh, Israel, correct? Yes. We talked a little bit about this um, earlier. Uh, you had been to Israel before, correct? No. You'd never been to Israel in 2015? No. Okay. Um, had you tried to set up a trip to Israel in 2015 or done some type of work uh, with uh, the Israeli government or anything like that? Yes. Okay. Tell me about that. I tried to set up a trip, uh, an official trip to Israel starting in 2015. Okay. Took a couple of years to pull it together. And so in 2017, um, you actually decided to set up a trip to Israel, correct? Yes. Okay. And your, your brother lives in Israel, correct? He lived in Bethlehem at the time. Okay. And he actually he taught school there or worked in a school there. My brother was a missionary uh, there and he taught in a school there. Okay. And he was, I think he was, yes, he taught in school there. Okay. And in teaching at the school there, um, his wife lived with him as well. Did they have, correct? Yes. Did they have kids? Yes. Um, in June of 2017, um, you, you provided us with emails where you were planning a trip to Israel and trying to set up different events or uh, official events, correct? Yes. Um, at that point, initially, did you have anything firmed up in June of 2017? I don't remember. I'm Tender exhibit or well, exhibits. It's going to be exhibits 121 and 232 through 121 and 232 through trying to get the last number. 242. 121 and 232 through 242. Those are admitted. Exhibit 121 is a campaign contribution disclosure report for election year in January 31st, 2018, covering a lot of time. Um, just to kind of cut to the chase, you never specifically disclosed uh, on your uh, campaign finance report your trip to Israel, correct? Only as an an American Express expense. You just wrote in miscellaneous expenses. Nobody would have known you'd spend campaign funds on a trip for you and your family to Israel, correct? Because you didn't list it there. Right. Other than the people who helped me plan it, I suppose. And that um, that trip, you ended up spending, it cost a little over $11,000. That sound about right? Uh, <clears throat> I don't remember the exact dollar amount on that trip. Okay. Looking at some of the emails here, um, I don't think I need to go into all of these emails, 
but I will um, go ahead and see they're in the record. We started trying to work with the Georgia Beverage Association back in June of 2017. That does that sound about right? I, if that's what the email said. I, I'll, I'll hand you these to refresh your recollection. How about that? Okay. As we go. Thank you. So we started sending emails in June of 2017 about trying to organize an official trip in Egypt, correct? <clears throat> well, at this time, I would have already been making efforts to start putting a trip together. But in June is when I started emailing with Kevin Perry at the Georgia Beverage Association. And you didn't end up buying your tickets. You, you bought the tickets in July, correct? The next month. I think so. What is the Beverage Association link to Israel? So Georgia Beverage Association is basically Coca-Cola company and they had facilities in West Bank, uh, Palestinian controlled West Bank, as well as in the uh, Israeli uh, controlled territories. And they set, up, um, they set up tours of their facilities there. <clears throat> and on these days, you're going back and forth, trying to set up uh, through the emails, uh, set up a, a, a tour of the, the facility there, correct? Yes. Okay. And you bought the tickets to Israel in July. I'm going to show you exhibit <coughs> what's been admitted as exhibit 240. You know, one of the things about this, about this trip that's kind of difficult to reconstruct the planning is because some of these emails would have been from my campaign, I mean, from my uh, legislative email account. And I don't have access to that anymore. I haven't had access to that at, at any of the times relevant to this proceeding. So I don't know if there were other emails from the legislative account um, that might have given more information about all of this process. Uh, those, those are the emails you provided us, correct? That's all I have. Okay. And going back to what my question was, is about on the, uh, you buying the uh, tickets in July. I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit. 240, um, and that is your closing date, 72717 okay. uh, credit card statement, correct? Account 1006? Yes. And starting here at the top of the screen there, July 14th, 2017, um, you bought several tickets with Delta, correct? Yes. Um, one $1,700 for a your son, yes. $160 for your daughter, yes. $1,700 for your other son, yes. $1,700 for Heidi, yes. and then $1,700 for you. Right. Okay. So that was you know, a, a good deal of money, right? That you spent on those tickets for Israel. Yes. And you immediately after that, um, that was paid off with campaign funds, correct? Yes. And not just for you, but for your wife and for your children too. You use campaign funds for your kids to go to Israel. I, I reimbursed it, but yes. When did you reimburse it? Um, after the trip. For the kids. And that was, yeah, I, I, February of 2018. Does that sound right? We'll, I, we'll get I to it. The trip or the reimbursement? The reimbursement. Does that sound right? I think so. So some seven months after you actually spent the money uh, from the campaign, you paid it back. Well, we, the trip was... The trip was end of September mm -hmm. through the first part of October. And so I didn't, uh, I didn't pay the MX for that cost until after the trip was finished because it was a possibility the trip we had canceled. And then when we got back from the trip, um, I just took a little, took a couple of three, three or four months to pay it back. Okay. So you use the money from the campaign account to pay for the tickets for your kids and then just paid it back months later. Yes. Okay. And so on this trip, um, I've got 240. While you were there, um, you did several different things with the family in addition to the official types of uh, uh, events, correct? Yes. Took the family to national parks and that type of thing. Yes. 
paid for it with campaign funds, correct? I'm not sure if I paid for their tickets with campaign funds or not. Did you ever, if, if all the, the money that was paid off on this credit statement after you spent all that money was with your campaign account and the first reimbursement from your personal account was in February and that was only for their tickets, then you would agree the campaign paid for all of these different things you did while in Israel with the kids, correct? No. Okay. Who paid for it? I paid for it with non-campaign funds. Okay. For the expenditures while you're in Israel, all of them? I paid for, I apportioned the expenses between campaign funds and non-campaign funds in an effort to make sure that there was a balance that my, my children were not being paid for by the campaign. Okay. I'm looking at exhibit 241 now. And that is closing date 92617. You see that? Yes. I'm going to go to the end of this statement here as we see. Um, on the 22nd, you've got an expenditure. At, uh, it's like Shake Restaurant in New York, $38.93. Yes. Okay. And this credit card statement afterwards was paid back all with campaign funds, correct? Yes. Okay. So you use that for, I assume you ate with your wife and kids? Um, that would have been, would have been, at, I think it was my meal. You spent $38 at the Shake Shack? In the, in the airport in New York City in the okay. middle of the night, yes. All right. Um, Zuni, a restaurant in Israel, $219? Yes. Okay. Coffee, fast food, hotels, lodging, all of that you paid for out of this with campaign funds, correct? Yes. McDonald's. And so that's just the first part of the trip uh, through the 25th. So I'm going to show you Exhibit 242 now. And this is closing date 102717. When you say you apportioned it, um, does that mean Judge Coomer, if you were at a restaurant, just stop for a sec. So you're at yes. Bella Glida fast food restaurant. You're using this credit card, your campaign credit card to pay for you. And then you'd use a different credit card to pay for your kids and your wife. No, that's not what I did. Uh, what I did is I tried to pay um, for a portion of the expense. I didn't mean to say I apportioned it. I meant to say I paid for a portion of the expenses with non-campaign funds. So, for example, there's some hotel lodging, there's some ex other expenses, and there was cash that I had on hand with me during the trip that I used to pay for some of the trip. So that's how I, um, that's how I justified the, the division of expenses. So there were expenses for this trip that are not on the Amex card. Understood. So like, here's the national parks. You may have gone to three national parks, one of which you paid for with cash, traveler's checks, whatever you had of your personal money, and then the other two national park visits, you may have used this card. Yes, sir. And um, yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, can I go ahead, Judge? Please. Okay, okay thank you. Um, so you've got tourist attraction, $170 there on the 25th, correct? Um, September 25th, 2017, you paid $170, um, $116 for uh, dining at a restaurant. So this, this tourist, where it says tourist attraction mm -hmm. was um, a, a price you had to pay to get to the um, Syrian border. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's called tourist attraction. It wasn't very touristy, but that's, that was a, that was related to traveling to the Syrian border. Okay, understood. We'll talk about that trip in a second. So 
and we see several meals eaten out $159 at a restaurant, $111 at a gas station, $92 at a flower shop, another $142 at a restaurant. Well, the flower shop wasn't a, wasn't an expensive Israel trip. Gotcha. Okay. Um, then you've got the National Parks Authority attraction, um, two different charges there on the same day. Um, you got more fast food. You get a $768 expense for Nazareth. Um, another $124 at the Palm in New York. Yes. On the way back from the trip. Yeah. Okay. And then you got $1,360 for um, some type of rental, I guess a car rental in Tel Aviv. You spent that as well. Yes. So, and all of these um, expenses were paid back, were paid with campaign funds, correct? Yes. Now, I know um, you talked about you know, setting up a trip um, through Georgia Beverage. You did not go on this trip every day um, to an official event with Coca-Cola, that type of thing. You did other things, correct? I did some uh, official function every day of the trip, except for the day I arrived. Okay. And we, we may disagree on what is official or not, but we'll go ahead and start and go through some of the things you did okay real quick. Well, and I'd also add that I, it wasn't just through the Georgia Beverage Association. I also coordinated with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. Um, I reached out to the uh, Israeli consulate and also coordinated with my brother who was there on the ground and had a lot of connections with local leaders as well. So you use your brother to set up official functions. Yes. And your brother's not an official government agent, employee, anything like that, correct? No, he was just a contact I had there. Like, hey, introduce me to somebody down here so I can chalk it up that day to an official visit, correct? No, like you're friends with the chairman of the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce. Can you set up a meeting with him? Mm -hmm. Yes. You have <laughs> friends who are in the education ministry in the Palestinian Authority. Can you set up meetings with them? Yes. Looking at your itinerary, this is Exhibit 238. Um, obviously, on the day, you know, that's perfectly permissible. On the, you, you have a travel day. Um, you did have some official actual events scheduled. So, you know, didn't have any events, but travel's okay for that. On the 24th, you have that meeting at the bridge. And the bridge is actually one of the Coca-Cola uh, type organizations that you went and toured, correct? Yes. Did your wife go on that one? No. So it was just you. Your wife did not go, so your wife did not engage in any official functions that day, and neither did your kids, correct? Correct. Okay. 25th of 2017, uh, you traveled to the Syrian border. Um, is this what you were talking about with that expense, the $170? Yes. Okay. You made uh, observations at the border and saw a military exercise, correct? Yes. Okay. Who set that up? I don't remember. Okay. Nobody official set that up from Georgia or any official government agency, correct? I don't remember who set it up. Okay. But you didn't talk to anybody official. You went and viewed this military exercise, correct? I, I went and observed the military exercise. I don't remember who set it up or how we set it up. That was a long time ago. Okay. Um, and then you uh, talked to a business owner um, about how to expand his business into Georgia and your wife was with you there, right? Yes. Okay. And you're saying that that day was filled with official legislative business? That's nine hours. Okay. Uh, the next day, the 26th, you're, uh, while in Caesarea, Israel, you met with Israeli Defense Forces and discussed the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, security in the West Bank. Uh, your wife was with you then, correct? Yes. Uh, were your kids with you that day? Yes. And you did that for one hour that day? Yes. And who set that up? I don't remember. It was a lunch meeting. A lunch, so you had lunch with somebody. I think it was, I, you know, I can't, I shouldn't say it was a lunch meeting. I remember it was a one hour meeting in the middle of the day. Okay. On the 27th, you attended a tour of the Jerusalem School of Bethlehem, met with kids and administrators and that type of thing about providing Christian education to meet American standards, right? Yes. Your wife was with you? Yes. And your kids were with you? Yes. Okay. And this was your brother's school, correct? It's the school my brother worked at, yes, but the school has been there for, I think, 70 years. He's no longer there, and the school is still there. Okay. So you toured the school that your brother worked at? Yes. All right. On the 28th of September, this is another one um, where you actually did, you went to Nav the um, National Beverage Company headquarters, 
uh, and you met with some leaders and some government officials on that day. Um, and then you provided gifts, economic development had given you a gift to give to one of those officials. Yes. And so you went that day and spent eight hours, correct? Yes. Your wife did not go. No. Your kids no. did not go. No. They did not engage in any official activities. Correct. Uh, September 29th, um, you traveled to Jericho and met with a Palestinian couple who are Georgia citizens. And you talked about different concerns uh, with them. And then you had dinner with a Georgia citizen who is a husband of a Palestinian citizen, correct? Yes. Your wife and kids were with you on that day. Yes. And you were claiming that that was official business for the legis as a legislator, correct? Yes. And then finally, on the 30th, you met with a Palestinian leader in Bethlehem to talk about doing business there and you gave him an official gift, correct? Yes. Again, your wife and kids went with you. Yes. Okay. So when you entered that consent agreement, you understand what the term mixed use is, correct? The consent agreement with the Ethics Commission. My understanding of mixed use is that it's a it's a trip that has both official and personal function. Right, and you realize you can't use campaign funds for all of a mixed use trip, correct? Would, correct. And you agreed in your consent order that you actually uh, had done that and had run about campaign finance costs, correct? I'm sorry, I, I, I consented to that I did what? That this was a mixed use trip in which you had uh, had to pay back, you were responsible for funds that were not appropriate to use campaign funds for, that you had to pay back. Right. So they, so the consent order says that it was a mixed use trip and that there was an amount uh, that should have been reimbursed above what I had already reimbursed. And so you signed off agreeing that you had, that was wrong, what you had done and you had to pay it back, correct? For the purposes of the consent order with Campaign Finance Commission, that's what we entered into. So is that a yes? You agree that you had violated it? I agreed for the purposes of the Campaign Finance Commission case and resolving that case, that that was, that was part of what needed to be corrected. Okay. So you think you managed the finances of the reimbursements and whatnot, this sort of apportionment, casual apportionment, I'll use some of my cash while in Israel, put other stuff on the campaign credit card. You think you managed that the right way and CFC got it wrong? No, no, I'm not saying that. I, I, I think that I, um, if I had it to do over, I'd do it differently, for sure. I'm not saying that I did it the right way. Um, what I'm saying is, I'm not sure that the numbers that the campaign finance came up with were uh, right and mine were wrong. I'm saying that I entered that consent order to, to uh, admit that I had um, made some errors and and that I was uh, willing to admit that. It kind of along the same lines, the campaign finance people may have the same opinion, like, you know, they may not agree with you that whether you did this or that, but they also within negotiations reached the settlement with you to agree to what you had in that consent agreement. Sure. Okay, speculation. Okay, yes. I'll withdraw. I'll handle that with the appropriate witness. Um, and. Uh, Judge, I'm not going to go into every account, that bank account that you have. Just a general summary, you had several accounts with uh, UCB, correct? Yes. Okay. You had a campaign account that ends in six, or 5012. Yes. Law firm is uh, ending in 2219. Yes. Personal, but with you and your wife during the time of all this going on is 2201. Yes. And without going into numbers, you also had an IOLTA account because you're an attorney. Yes. Um, you also, you had some accounts that came up later after um, this campaign finance stuff, but before the charges, correct? And those aren't in any way relevant to what we're here for today. That's right. Okay, and I'm only bringing that up because there were things that were involved in doing the funds tracing and that type of thing. Um, you also had a UBS account, correct? Yes. Okay. And what type of account was that? Well, before you go, there was also a, a CAC holdings account at United Community Bank that I had at that time. And that, of course, was relevant. Well, yes, and I, I, I'm going to ask you several questions about that and get into it in more detail. And there were other accounts, as you mm -hmm. pointed out, that were not, either didn't exist at that time or were not relevant to any of this. Okay. Back in 2015, um, when you took the guardianship case with Jim Philhart, uh, did you have any other accounts other than those UCB accounts? Do you have any separate checking accounts or um, anything like that? In 2015? Correct. 15 to 16. How about 2016, 17? I, I don't know when I opened the UBS investment account, but it was mm -hmm. probably around that time. 
And aside from UBS and the UCB accounts, did you have any other checking account or savings account or anything like that? Or was that the, that it? I think at that time I did not. Okay. Um, okay. And the UBS was an investment account, correct? Yes. And with that account, I assume you're the only one that was authorized to withdraw money, transfer money, that type of thing with your UBS account? I would be the only one authorized, yes, to withdraw. Um, the the broker could move money around, but once it got in there, right? And, okay. All right. So turn into to Mr. Philhart for um, I'm sure everybody's like finally. Um, your first relationship as a client with him was in 2015, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll yes. Sir. I'd like to ask enjoy your question here. Yes. Sir. You have these these Amex charges. Yes. Was it your policy that when you got the American Express credit card statement each month, that in order to stay current with American Express, the campaign checking account would pay American Express for the full amount? Or did you? That is the question. Is that the way you handled it month after month? It was on an auto pay every month. Okay. So automatically, anything that you charge on your American Express card, was paid by the, your campaign checking account. Yes. And then you would periodically come back and identify certain transactions. And then you would take personal funds from wherever and put that in the, the campaign checking account to, in essence, reimburse the campaign checking account with expenses that you felt were not appropriate campaign expenses. Is that a, a reasonable? Yes, to how you handle the transaction. Yes, with one caveat, which is there were also times when I would pay money directly to the American Express account from non campaign funds. Now, you just finished saying that it was an automatic yes, sir. charge every month. What would cause you to make an extra payment to American Express when it was an automatic charge? Well, if I knew that I had a non campaign related expense, I would simply make an extra payment to American Express. So the following month, the balance the amount, would just be lower. The amount would be lower, okay. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Why would you use the American Express for a non-campaign expense? If you knew I'm putting new tires on my car that I only use to go to the lake house. Right. I don't drive it down to the Capitol or anything like that. Why would you use the Amex such that you would then need to go behind and make this special one-off payment to American Express? It was usually a, a matter of uh, convenience or if I was in a situation where I just didn't have another payment method with me, I would do that. Um, or like in, these, in some of these cases that there were a few of these instances where something that I thought was gonna be campaign related became clearly not campaign. So, uh, Judge Coomer, I was about to ask you about your relationship with Jim Philhart. Before 2015, when you took his guardianship case, you had actually met him before, correct? Yes. And he'd come to you in 2013, I believe, uh, to talk to you about some matter you may have handled for him. Right. Like some small matter. It's an HOA dispute. Other than that, did you know him at all before the guardianship in 2015? I don't know if I'd ever met him before, other than that yeah. time in my office. And so in April of 2015, uh, he became your client, correct? Yes. And you took on the guardianship matter. Yes. At that time, he was 74 years old, correct? I think that's right. Okay. And in 2015, you would have been 40. I'm sorry? In 2015, you would have been 40 years old. I think so. I was born in 1974. At least a part of it. So socially, you didn't know him. Professionally, you didn't know him. Um, when he came and talked to you about the guardianship, um, you told him this would be a tough road to hoe, basically, right? Right, and socially, I, I may have had interactions with him before, I just don't remember. I know that I had social interactions with him over the years, but I don't know if, when that started. Okay. In any event, the, the main part of your relationship with him began in 2015, in April, when he retained you to represent him in this guardianship, correct? Yes. And 
when y'all talked about cost, you told them it was going to be expensive. Yes. And whether you told him it was going to be the end amount or not, do you remember discussing with him twenty to thirty thousand dollars? No. Is it possible you did have that conversation with him and did say that? I would not have told him that your case is going to cost twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Because. Because I didn't know how much it would cost. I told him it was going to be expensive. And what was his reaction when you said it'd be twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars? I didn't say that to him. Oh, was, okay. I'm sorry. When you said it was super expensive, so you never mentioned anything about any amount. You never said the term 20,000, 30,000 or anything like that in trying to give him an estimate about how much it would cost. That's incorrect. Okay. I, I obviously at some point quoted him a retainer of $20,000 mm -hmm. because that's what's in our agreement. I never said to him, it's going to be 25 to $30,000 and we'll be done. I never told him what the, what the, total cost would be because I didn't know. So if he said you gave him an estimate between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars, he's just not telling the truth about it. I it's that is not correct. Okay. Then how would he have come to the term twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars? How does he get that in his head that you've said that? The same. You, you when when investigator Alfred came to talk offer came to talk to you about this case, he asked you specifically, you know, of any reason or motivation that Jim Philhart, any reason he would lie about anything? Are you asking me a question? Yes. Do you remember him asking you that? I don't. I don't remember the specific questions he asked me. That was a long time ago. Do you remember telling him that you couldn't think of any reason that Jim would be untruthful? I probably told him I didn't know why Jim would lie about me. Okay. All right. Um, you would agree when Jim came to talk to you. Um, you would, Jim's would just. How would you describe his personality? Um, he's a he's a determined fellow. I think that's the word I used in the deposition. Uh, so I'd say he's a determined fellow who does what he wants to do. You would, you would agree when he came to you, he was very uh, emotional about the situation with Winnell Waycaster. He was, he was determined to have uh, guardianship of Winnell Waycaster if he could make it happen, if he could get it, if there was a way to do it. My question is actually, would you agree that he was emotional about the situation with Winnell Waycaster? He was, yeah, he cared deeply about Winnell and he was upset that he couldn't see her. You'd agree he loved Winnell Waycaster. I think he did. And she, at this point, had suffered a traumatic brain injury and was in a nursing home, correct? Yes. And he was attempting to get guardianship of her, correct? That's what he came to see me about, yes. And she had actually lived in a house beside him that somehow he had ended up funding her getting that house, correct? Yes. So he lived beside her. He had funded getting her into that house. She has this traumatic brain injury and he's wanting to be with her is basically what it comes down to, correct? Yes. Um, and through this guardianship uh, work with him over this time, you learned that he and Winnell had had a tumultuous relationship, correct? Yes. Um, and y'all talked a lot about that, right? You and Mr. Philhart. Well, we certainly, we talked about it. I don't remember how much we talked about it. You learned that she had lied to him repeatedly over the years, correct? I, I do know that, yes, I know that she lied to him. You knew that he had said that she had taken financial advantage of him before, correct? Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I know that he was, he relayed to me that she had been dishonest with him, but I never talked to her because she couldn't communicate right. to me at the time. But that was your understanding that she had taken financial advantage of him before, correct? No. Okay. Um, did you talk to Dr. Moon about it? Didn't he write a letter for the guardianship? I did not talk to Dr. Moon. Did he provide you with a letter regarding uh, Winnell and Mr. Philhart's relationship back in 2016? Yes. And he described their relationship? He gave me a letter in 2016, and I don't remember the contents, but it was about the relationship. I'm pretty sure. All right.
from tender exhibit 250 at this point. Objection. Admitted. I'm sorry, this is pulled up the wrong one. It's the other Dr. Moon letter. Just one second, Judge, I'll find the right one. What 250 will eventually come in anyway. Thank you. It's in. It is. It was the wrong, wrong exhibit. Sorry. Okay. Uh, exhibit actual 250. Um, I was looking at the wrong hard copy. Sorry, I, I pulled up the wrong one. So, okay. Now the 250 is, is the hard copies in. Uh, May 2, 8, uh, 18, 2016, Dr. Moon wrote a letter uh, at your request, correct? I think, <clears throat> I don't know if I requested it or Jim requested it, but he wrote it for our, our case. Right. And throughout this letter, um, Dr. Moon talks about seeing them in therapy. Um, and then he said they he recounts that they began dating and he knew that he purchased a home for Miss Waycaster next door, correct? Yes. Um, the last sentence of that last paragraph, Mr. Phil Hart paid for all these activities because Miss Waycaster was not financially responsible. That's what it says. Okay. Um, and then the next paragraph, Mr. Phil Hart and Miss Waycaster came into therapy due to having a stormy relationship that was intensified by Ms. Waycaster's inability to let things go and they disagreed, resulting in Mr. Phil Hart becoming extremely angry, correct? Yes. And then uh, he goes on to talk about, in addition, Ms. Waycaster often lied about her events in her life, especially financial. Yes. And then he talks about more than a few times Mr. Phil Hart provided her with additional funds for her pay, to pay her bills. Yes. Both parties, uh, you, it talks about, um, Denied physical abuse, although there wasn't an incident. An incident, Miss Waycaster reported for physical abuse, but denied it, recanted, and the case was dropped. Yes. And then from the beginning of therapy, um, it goes in. You, you talk about, or Dr. Moon talks about her exaggerating arguments, such as the physical abuse. He diagnosed her with a personality disorder, um, and then basically went on to say that he terminated uh, working with her. Correct. So you asked for this to talk about, and this is how something else you learned about the relationship with Mr. Phil Hart and Ms. Waycaster, right? Yes. <clears throat> and regarding, since that, that issue has been brought up, this allegation of domestic violence, um, in the guardianship, you took the position that Jim didn't do it, correct? Um, I don't remember how we addressed that specifically. I think we also had a letter from his attorney at the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we expressly denied it. We, we kind of, I mean, we kind of danced around it. I don't remember exactly how we dealt with it. You, get, you got an attorney to write an affidavit that said it didn't happen, right? She recanted to him and Jim was truthful and he believed him and that type of thing. I didn't get the attorney to write it. The attorney wrote it and gave it to us. Did you request it from the attorney? Hey, can you give me an affidavit? I don't know if I did or Jim did, but we got it for the purpose of the litigation. And you used that to defend Jim? Yes. Well, I used it to represent his interest in becoming the guardian of Wynell Waycaster. Were you aware that Winnell had stolen from him and taken advantage of him. No. During this time, you also learned that Dr. Moon had actually taken out an unsecured loan from Mr. Phil Hart, correct? No. You didn't learn that Mr. Dr. Moon had gotten money from Mr. Phil Hart? Not during the guardianship. Okay, after it, at some point you learned that he had taken out a loan from him, correct? Yes, I think that would have been in 2017. Just generally, Mr. Phil Hart, you would agree he was a lonely person. Uh, he had few friends. And he didn't have any family in the area either, did he? Uh, he had, I was not aware of any family they had in the area. You would agree that if he considered you a friend, he was going to email you, text you, call you um, all the time. He did email, text, and call me frequently. 
he had other acquaintances, but he didn't have a lot of people that were, I guess, friends with him. Uh, through the guardianship, you learned about his finances, his, his wealth, that his estate was um, over, worth over, he was worth over a million dollars, correct? Through the guardianship? Yes. Yes, because I, because I knew he was going to have some expenses with regard to Winnell's upkeep. On the eve of trial, I said, do you have the financial, I mean, it's just not really anything we talked about early on, but it, on the eve of trial, I remember asking him, do you have the financial resources to support what else she needs additional help in addition to her social security income. And he said, yep, I've got about a million dollars. I said, okay, sounds good. So you did learn through the guardianship that he in fact? Yes. Okay. Going to, um, when you, um, Mr. When Mr. Phil Hart retained you, um, you entered into an attorney client agreement. Yes. And in doing that, you went over it with Mr. Phil Hart and you told him, hey, this is going to be a tough case to win. I advise you not to go down this road. And then you said, however, if we do this, because you decide about that point, if you've got the client agreement, he said he wants to sign on with you, right? I don't understand what you're asking. Okay. Even though I had that disclaimer, hey, this case is going to be tough. I advise you not to do it. Um, by the point you're giving him your attorney client agreement, y'all have already reached the point he's going to retain you, right? Well, I don't know. I, I talked to him about the problems with the case and all the sort of ugly parts of the case. And I advised him not to pursue the case. And I think I, I think I put that in the writing before we entered an agreement to make sure that um, it was just reiterated once again, this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a case I wouldn't pursue if I were. And in doing that, had you reached an agreement on a retainer for the guardianship? By the time I drafted the retainer agreement, we had. By the time you did the attorney-client agreement, had you reached that? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying retainer agreement, and you're saying attorney-client agreement. I think we're talking about the same thing. Okay, that's the same thing, right? So once you read, you come to an amount, how much did you say that you were going to charge him as a retainer? In the case? I believe it's $20,000 is what's on the agreement. I'll be glad to look at it just to compare. Yes, and I'm, I'm going to get to that. Okay. Um, I mean, you remember it's twenty thousand dollars he paid you, right? I, I'm pretty sure, yes, but I don't want to. I don't want to make a mistake and get it wrong. And okay, understood. I just want to be sure. All right, I'm going to uh, tender Exhibit One Twenty Eight at this point. Correct. It's the attorney client agreement. Minute. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so it's a twenty thousand dollar retainer. I'm going to ask you some questions about that. Um, you want to go ahead and review it before before we start talking for the sake of efficiency. Okay. Did you move it a bit up on the screen for the rest of it? Oh yes. I'm sorry. I was going to. All right. With my questions. Okay. All right. This is the attorney client agreement that you drafted uh, and had Jim Philhart sign, right? Yes, and I signed it as well. Okay. So you actually drafted the document, right? Not Jim, not right. another attorney. That's right. Okay. You put all the terms in it that are in that agreement. Okay. Yes, I mean, this was kind of a standard form I'd used. I don't know where I got the original form. I probably picked it up from another attorney and then adapted it for my purposes. Right. But this is what you wanted to use as an attorney-client agreement, correct? This is what we used, yes. Okay. Um, and so you, as the attorney, presented this to Mr. Philhart, correct? I did. Okay. Um, in this, you listed... Um, the rate, uh, your hourly rate is $300 an hour to represent him in the guardianship matter, correct? Yes. Um, Subject to periodic increases. And we'll get to that. Did you um, also charge him the same amount for travel time during the course of your representation? Yes. 
And this was actually the guardianship matter was in Hall County, correct? It's when I, when he hired me, it was in Bartow County. Mm -hmm. And then it um, was moved to Hall County mm -hmm. after we had already started the case. And so I, at that time, I, well, anyway, yeah, that's, okay. that answers your question, I think. So, and you mentioned the increase. Um, you also had a provision in there that you could increase uh, the hourly rate to Mr. Phil Hart uh, from 300 to a maximum of $350, correct? Yes. Without notice to him, correct? Correct. And just a few months after starting representation, starting on July 15th, 2015, you bumped it up and started charging him $350 an hour, right? I know we increased it. I'm not sure of the exact date. Your billing records would accurately at the first $350 hourly charge is July 15, 2015 on your billing record, that would be accurate, correct? Yes. So that's just a couple of months after you started representing. Yes. And you had not even expended the $20,000 retainer at that point by a long shot, correct? I don't know what you mean by long shot, but I had not expended the retainer, I think. And you actually never told him that you bumped up his uh, the charges from hourly rate from 300 to 350 ever, did you? I did not. Not that I recall. And you, you, he learned to trust you through the process of this guardianship, correct? I mean, he trusted me, for sure. Right. And you've heard him say he, he thinks you walk on water, right? Uh, I, I know he trusted me. I don't remember exactly what descriptive terms he used. Have you ever used a, uh, a, a provision like that with any other client? Um, Which provision? I'm sorry, that... It, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the increasing a rate without notice to a client. It was probably, it, it may have been in other agreements as well. Okay. Do you ever remember any client you've ever done that to or done that with? I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay, on this um, attorney agreement, going back to the, the top, there's a provision in there that talks about um, you are retained and that the representation for this is limited to the matter described herein, correct? You see that? It's like the first sentence in that first big paragraph. Yes. Representation in any other matter by this law firm requires you to sign a separate attorney client agreement. Yes. You wrote that in there and that was part of the agreement that you signed, correct? That's right. This last paragraph, um, full paragraph at the bottom, unless specifically agreed otherwise in writing attached here to and incorporated herein by reference, this attorney client agreement is the entire agreement between the parties here to and may not be altered or amended except in writing and approved and executed, ex executed by all parties here to, correct? Yes. And, and we'll get to a little bit about that more, but after Tell the me. guardianship concluded, you continued to represent Jim Philhart, correct? So after after the guardianship concluded yes after the guardianship concluded i continued to do um some legal work for jim and and we did not have a new uh, written agreement you did no new written agreement you didn't follow the terms of your own attorney client agreement correct that's i don't i don't know what you mean in that regard your agreement right here says if you enter into any other case or do any other work for them, you've got to set up another agreement, right? I don't think I was required to have a new agreement. Uh, obviously, the parties agreed to a different agreement. It says you have to do it in writing. You didn't. I mean, this is what your agreement is that you drafted what it says you have to do to do further work and you didn't follow it. Would you agree with that? Well, I would I would agree with you that there is not another written agreement. And yet I did more work for Jim. I'm gonna turn to 
Exhibit 129. Okay, I will tender Exhibit 129 at this time. Already on the screen, so I hope you're not going to object. Okay, submit. Uh, exhibit 129. If you're looking at that, Judge, um, this is a reflection of the the twenty thousand dollars that Jim Philhart paid you uh, to represent you as a retainer on the guardianship. Correct. Yes. Okay, and that says seven April two thousand and fourteen, but the date was actually two thousand and or the year was two thousand and fifteen when he sit, submitted this to you. Correct. Yes. Okay, and you deposited that twenty thousand dollars. I think so. Do you remember where you deposited it? I don't. Okay. And you started doing some work for him. And in August, you've been representing him a few months, you requested an additional $10,000 from him as well, correct? Yes. Okay. And he paid you another $10,000 without asking a question, correct? I don't know if he asked any questions. I probably would have had to explain why there was an additional fee. Okay. At this point, though, per your own billing records, you had not even done $20,000 worth of work, correct? I think that's right. Okay. And you've gone ahead and you requested another $10,000 at that point, and he paid you. Yes. <clears throat> and as far as billing statements, and I think this was your testimony at the deposition, um, you stated that you gave Phil Hart one invoice during the time you represented him, and that was May 29th, the first two pages of what will be Exhibit 104. Do you remember testifying to that, that that's the only bill you ever sent him? Yes. Okay. Well, obviously before the litigation started, before the litigation between him and me. Okay. So in 2016, you'd worked from 2015 until there was a final hearing in June of 2016, correct, on the guardianship. <clears throat> and at that uh, hearing, um, you guys won. You got guardianship of Winnell Lake, correct? Yes. And you remember one of the things that you, you told Jim you thought really made a difference or that really made the difference in the case is that she came in, or maybe the judge said it, that... Uh, they noticed Winnell smiled at Jim when he came in or something like that. Yes. You remember that? And after y'all won, how, what was Jim's? I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, I, I probably would have pointed that out to Jim because I remember the judge didn't want to bring Winnell Waycaster to the final hearing because she was an invalid and there was some trouble getting her there. And so I insisted that he, that she be brought and it was her presence there, I think, made a difference in the judge's final decision in the case. I was pointing that out to Jim at the time. And so you all won. And then you remember coming back to, uh, I guess, did you go back to your office afterward in Cartersville? Uh, this would have been probably not the same day because okay. we were in court all day and finished up. And that was in Gainesville, which is a couple hours drive from Cartersville. And... When you got, whenever you met back up with him to quote, settle up for it, um, he paid you an additional $50,000, correct? Yes. And you, you agree, you had, the work you had done at that point wasn't even close to an $80,000 total, correct? What we, he and I sat down and talked about 
what it would be worth to just have the case, have the billing finished. He said, I pay you $100,000. I said, it's not, I don't know what the billing is, but it's not that much. We agreed to $50,000 as the right amount. And I told him in exchange for that, not only would I don't have to do any more billing, uh, produce bills, but that um, I would help him going forward. And I know you guardianship to... or with anything he needs. Well, it was, I'll help you going forward. In my mind, it meant I would help him with uh, guardianship issues as they arose. I knew that that was something that would continue to come up. Um, I didn't, I didn't intend it. I don't think he thought I intended it. I mean, I would represent him forever on everything else. Although I wound up doing a lot of other things for him over the years because we were friends. And you agree, you don't, you'd only earned like $45,000. So 35,000 of this at that point when he gave you the end of this month, the, the, the full amount of this money, you had not earned a great amount of that money. You basically just, you have $30,000 sitting there, I guess, that he's working off of. Well, I, I saw it as this agreement was essentially replacing our prior agreement. So he decided to pay me this flat amount of money mm -hmm. and whatever the billing was before didn't matter anymore. And of course you did a new agreement with him, right? Yes. You did? You did a new, okay. Did you have that written agreement? It was an oral agreement. Oh, an oral agreement. Okay. It's confirmed by his payment of money. But it couldn't have been, he just thought he owed 50,000 for the guardianship. Respect to the form, respect to wage. Same. Did you specifically say to Jim Philhart, I want $50,000, you know, this is the amount I'm requesting. And this will not only be for what I've done, but for representing you on all this other myriad of things that may come up in the future. No. Okay. At the time when you settled up and he paid you this extra $50,000, did you provide him then with an invoice or a billing statement of the work you had done on the guardianship? No. <clears throat> um, the month after, did you do that? No, part of our agreement was that I wouldn't have to do that. So you, you agreed your way out of having to, do, to provide him with proof of what you had done? I agreed that I would not have to draft and edit and prepare a billing statement that would have covered many months. I just didn't, that was work I hated to do. If you haven't been able to tell by now, I just don't like accounting. Did you ever present him with a breakdown of your time in the case? No. <clears throat> and I know you talked about becoming friends with him too. You would agree that a lot of times you have attorneys who they become friendly with their clients, right? I would imagine that's a common occurrence. Right, right. But you understand that just because you're friends with somebody that you represent, you're still the attorney, right? Sometimes. You still have the same obligations as the attorney, correct? Sometimes, not always. It's especially important if somebody trusts you implicitly as their attorney for a myriad of things to respect that relationship and understand and separate it, right? I'm so, I don't understand your question. You're you, saying that it's important to separate the friendship from the attorney relationship? Yes, you can't let it. Don't, do you remember saying to, I believe, the investigative panel um, that you made a mistake by blurring the lines between lawyer and uh, client? Correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I agree. I have not, I'm not trying to run from that at all. And for instance, when you drafted these wills, you say you're doing them as his friend when you drafted these wills. Yes. You're still acting as an attorney, right? Yes. You're still bound by the rules of professional conduct, correct? Yes. Can I go back one second, please? Um, Sorry. Earlier, it was clarified that the will. My understanding was that, and your testimony this morning that was that when adult protective services came to you regarding this bill of mold disputes, 
receipt of the eight thousand dollar bills in place. We provide a set of bills to APS. So what happened? The short answer is yes, with a little asterisk. Okay. Um, I did provide records to them mm -hmm. that showed work I had done both on the guardianship and on stuff that I did for Jim after the guardianship, uh, other work that I did for him in the years following. But I explained, I have explained, I don't know where exactly, but I've explained, I, I know in this case before, that, um, that that was, I kept those records as internal timekeeping records, not so I could someday in the future send a bill to Jim or to have proof of, uh, of billing that I could uh, provide to him or anybody else. It was basically to make sure that if, it, if I was doing something for him, uh, I got it done in a timely manner. I would be able to look back and say, okay, I finished that thing. Um, but it wasn't for the purpose of billing. So unlike a, a billing statement where I would go in and sort of fly spec it and make sure I got it as right as possible, those were kind of um, drafts, They're more rough drafts. So that's what I provided to them. Did you, did you provide or did you explain to them that this $50,000 flat fee for the in essence, replace the billable hour agreement you had signed I don't think we had that discussion. So that document you presented to them, uh, did, when did you create that? Oh, it would have been probably, I, I don't know exactly when it was, but it was probably in the time leading up to meeting with them. So basically you had not created any document whatsoever reflecting all of that time and the, I guess your time records about trying to count things that you had done for Mr. Philhart after the guardianship against $50,000. You had not created a document like that until they reached out to you and then you went back and created this document. No, no, let me, let me be clear what I mean when, I, when, when you're saying created. I guess when you say created, what I'm thinking of is printing it out. Um, because the program I had, the billing program I had, I would have just, we would have just entered time entries into the program as we went along. Um, or sometimes you would go back and reconstruct the, an entry. But um, I, I believed that everything, or at least most everything that I would have done for Jim at that time would have been captured in that program. So I felt comfortable just printing it out and saying, this is, you know, this is what I did for him. Even though it wasn't necessarily 100% accurate, it was, I felt close enough to be, I could, I could say this was about what I did for him. And Judge, we're about to get into another area that may take a long time. I don't know how long you wanted to go tonight. Um, well, I was about to ask you the yeah. same question. So um, let's pause the questions. Um, how much more total time do you estimate you have with Judge Coomer? Um, probably because we have to go through the wills and loans, I think probably until lunch tomorrow. Okay. Um, is that on schedule with what you thought you'd be doing? Or if you do manage to finish by lunch tomorrow with Judge Coomer, are we behind? Are we ahead? Where? I, I think with the people we have scheduled, we should be on track given the timing and the very different length of time it will take with these other witnesses. Um, so I think we are on time as far as wrapping up when we talked about possibly by the end of the day, Thursday. Okay. And you're about to pivot to a different type. We're, we're done with the billing for the guardian. I'm going to, well, it, it's going to go into the topic of the billing, but in there and getting in depth into the actual records and talking about that too. Okay. Um, Getting in depth and records at 455 seems like maybe not the best recipe for progress. So um, we can pause for today. Request for tomorrow. One would be a hard copy of the exhibit list. I appreciate it may have been emailed to us, but I don't know that any of the three of us have printer access between now and tomorrow since we won't be in our home offices. And second, just as I noticed you working with Judge Coomer, the more you can get him a hard copy of what you're asking them about, especially if it's a multi-page document. Um, as the author or someone who's familiar with the documents, it seems easier for Judge Coomer if he's got the document there, rather than have, could you scroll down? He knows where he wants to go in the document. I think will flow a little more smoothly, whether you give him a binder that you can collect from him afterwards, or once you tender it, you give that original to 
Judge Coomer, you may need it, but then have a second copy for him. I think um, will flow a little more smoothly. I, I'm noticing that Judge Coomer's lawyers are usually able to find things, so they've got the hard copy. We're getting by for now without the hard copy, but it's more a request for, and not just Judge Coomer, I think witnesses going forward, the more you can give them the exhibit, unless you know the only thing you're gonna be doing, this one page, this one thing on the screen, um, I think that'll be helpful. I picked up on that too, and I will start doing that. I'll, the, the exhibit that I tender, I'll give to you. Great, thank you. Any other process suggestions? Oh, that'll work. Okay. Um, we're going to start as close to 9 a.m. tomorrow as we can. We'll get the Zoom feed back up. Um, please try to be here by then. Um, and the courtroom will be open. Mr. Lefko seems to be the one who turns the lights on here. He'll know when the courtroom opens. <laughs> He'll get it going. Um, anything else, um, Mr. Boring, from the JQC side? No, Your Honor. Sir Kingma, anything from Judge Boomer's side? All right, you guys were quiet today. I'm sure you'll start piping up more tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you. I mean, you don't want to leave your fancy tablet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Ms. Johnson, we will not see you tomorrow. Let me talk CBD on Wednesday, but it'll be someone. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, we'll be here every day. <laughs> 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 <laughs>